call the meeting to order for Wicomico County Council Legislative Session 2024-07 for April 2nd, 2024. Those who'd like to stand and join us in the Lord's Prayer and Pledge of Allegiance, please do. Our Father, uh, who art Lord in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Entertain a motion from council to approve the uh, consent agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussions or corrections? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motions carried. Consent agenda is passed unanimously. unanimously. At this time, we have a proclamation to recognize the month of April as Child Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, we have Miss Jamie Riley. I hope. Shane Baker will be uh, presenting the proclamation. Whoever wants to come up, yeah, we'll take we'll take everybody. Bring the puppy. Bring them up. Bring them all up. Michael, John. Wait, the dogs involved? Sure. Wendy. Oh. Great. John, come right on up, front center. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> You guys spread out on both sides of uh, Councilman Baker. Get on, get on both sides, however you'd like to do it. Oh, boy. And if anybody wants to take pictures, keep in mind, you can come up here as close as you want and take the picture. It's not, it's not a problem. <laughs> so this is a proclamation, National Child Abuse Prevention Month. Whereas it is estimated uh, nationally that more than 1,540 children die each year from child abuse and neglect. And whereas child abuse is a serious public health problem, with studies documenting the link between abuse and a wide range of medical, emotional, psychological, and behavioral disorders. And whereas child abuse prevention is a community responsibility that requires partnerships among various agencies that work with children. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Wacomico County Council pro proclaim April 2024 as National Child Abuse Prevention Month. Thank you, County Council, for uh, the recognition. While we are here, I wanted to say an incredible thank you to our team. Um, Why Comico <laughs> does it right, the way that we investigate, prosecute, and treat victims of child abuse, and we couldn't do it without these really great people. Um, in addition, we have some great news. Um, Josiah is um, a full assistance dog. His handler, Wendy Meyer, is um, joining us to assist um, from this point forward um, in the treatment of victims of child abuse at the Wicomico CAC. So we've got a lot to celebrate today. Thank you. Do you want us up here? Front and center. Don't be shy. John's never shy any other time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate the support. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you can leave the dog. <laughs> yeah, the dog's cool. Yeah, bring him over here. Next, we have a proclamation uh, to recognize the month of April as Fair Housing Month. We have Joni Kindle. Kindle? Yes. yes. How are you? Good to see you. Uh, Councilman Jeff, uh, Vice President Jeff Merritt will be uh, reading the proclamation for you. How are you? 
Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. All right. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is a proclamation for Fair Housing Month. Whereas the National Fair Housing Act of 1968 prohibits discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, color, religion, or gender, individuals with disabilities, and families with children. And whereas the principle of fair housing is a fundamental human concept and entitlement for all people and recognizes the contributions and richness tendered by a wide variety of people from diverse backgrounds, colors, ethnicities, and religious traditions. Now therefore, the Wicomico County Council proclaims April 2024 as the Fair Housing Month and in an effort to raise awareness of fair housing for all, encourage all citizens to support putting an end to housing discrimination done the second day of April 2024 and signed by all members of the Wicomico County Council. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Like yes, um, just words. wanted to say thank you to everyone, the county council, county executive, and our administration for recognizing us uh, this month. And um, the theme for the fair housing is the act in action this year. So once again, we just want to say thank you. I brought my colleague here. We're part of the team. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mrs. Hurley. Good evening, Council President, Council Members, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have several public hearings on the agenda this evening. Each of the public hearing notices are posted on the county's website and were published in the local newspaper when required by law. The first public hearing is on resolution number 35-2024. This is to amend the Wacomico County Water and Sewer Plan for the property located at 1501 Pemberton Drive, Salisbury, Maryland. <coughs> and we had Mr. Brian Wilkins here, engineer with the Department of Parks. At this time, we open the floor for public mm -hmm. hearing on resolution 35-2024. you have any comments that you'd like to make in reference to this specific resolution? Come to the podium, please state your name, your county of residence, and your concerns. That concludes the uh, public hearing on resolution number 35-2024. Entertain a motion from council to approve resolution 35-2024. Second. second. Motion, second. Discussion. Good evening, Mr. Wilkins. We'll let Thank you have the floor, and we'd like to explain this for, for the uh, council. Yeah, this is... Um it's a request for a, a water sewer uh, plan amendment so that um, I believe that this is 1501 Pumpkin Drive. Um, yes. Yeah, so they can connect to public public water sewer provided by the city of Salisbury. Okay. Right. It's a property that's off Pemberton that's uh, contiguous with the city right now. Right. As and is. they're currently in the process of the annexation process. Right. Because that's required to connect to public services as well. I don't know why. I don't know why they just don't <laughs> let us pay for the service and, and go go along our way, right? Yeah. <laughs> they want everything. I any, think, any, uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, I, I, was, I was just going to say, because I, I asked the city about this one. This one is currently um, in the beginning of the annexation process. Okay. That's good. Any other questions, discussion? All those in favor of Resolution 35-2024 say aye. 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 Opposed? Motions carried. Resolution passes unanimously. So. Next is a public hearing resolution number 36-2024. This is to amend the Wacomico County Water and Sewer Plan for the property located at 2407 North Salisbury Boulevard, Salisbury, Maryland. Thank you. At this time, we open the floor for public hearing on resolution 36-2024. Again, if you have any comments that you'd like to make, come to the podium, state your name, your county of residence, and your concerns. Includes the public hearing for resolution 36-2024. Entertain a motion from council to approve resolution 36-2024. So moved. Second. Second. Motion is second. Discussion. Mr. Wilkins. Uh, 
this is the same uh, situation here. Uh, they're uh, trying to connect the public uh, city services, water and sewer. Uh, I, I didn't know if you get, uh, the council knows that this was actually the only property in that whole area that isn't designated as S1W1. <coughs> I'm not sure why that is. I guess it just got left behind. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> any other questions, comments? All those in favor of resolution 36 2024 say aye. 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 Opposed? Motions carried. Resolution passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. Thank you. Next is a public hearing on resolution number 37 24. This is to approve the relocation of a forest conservation easement containing 0 0.41 acres located on tax, tax map 101, parcel 5489, owned by Mill Pond Village LLC, to an off site mitigation bank. And Mr. Colin Harrison here, environmental planner. Um, he is here if you have any questions. This time we open the floor for public hearing on resolution number 37, 2024. If you have any comments that you'd like to make, come to the podium, please state your name, your county of residence, and your concerns. That concludes the public hearing on resolution 37, 2024. I entertain a motion from council to approve resolution 37, 2024. Move. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motions carried. Resolution passes. Okay, next is a public hearing on resolution number 38 2024 to approve the release of a portion of a forest conservation easement containing 0 0.58 acres located on tax map 21, parcel 92, lot 3AB, owned by Lene Ann Rittenhouse and John R. Rittenhouse. This time we open the floor for a public hearing on Resolution 38, 2024. Have any comments? Come to the podium, please. State your name, county residence, and your concerns. Okay. That concludes the public hearing on Resolution 38, 2024. Entertain a motion from council to approve Resolution 38, 2024. Second. Second. Any discussion? Any Present. questions? Yes. Oh, Mr. Um, Mr. Harrison. Mr. Harrison is here. Good evening. For the public, could you just state your name and position for us? Thank Colin you. Harrison, environmental planner for Wicomico County. Thank you. Hey, Colin. Uh, can you provide a little more detail and background? I'm trying to understand what was uh, put in the document saying that they were fixing the, the correct of the plot or the, the plot for, for it. Can you give some background, sure. I guess, on what's So happened? during the original subdivision of this property, they conserved or retained more forest than what was necessary for the forest conservation worksheet. So all in all, they were doing a good thing by retaining more forest on site. Um, being they conserved more, they're allowed to get back to that threshold. And then I guess future use of the property, is it, is it um, do we know if it's gonna be? It's just residential. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Anything else you wanna share? No, that's about it. <laughs> all those in Thanks favor. <laughs> all those in favor of resolution 38, 2024, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motions carried. Resolution 38, 2024 passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, next is resolution number 39 2024. This is extending an audit contract by and between Wacomico County, Maryland, and PKS and Company PA for fiscal year 2024. And we have Michael C. Kleger, CPA, and Pam Olin here, Director of Finance, if you have any questions. All right. I obtain a motion from Council to approve resolution 39 2024. It's a move. Second. 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 Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor of resolution 39, 2024, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motions carried. Resolution passes. Thank you for being here, Mr. Clayer. Mr. President, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Yeah, there she is. She is. I'm Evangelie Chattel, our, our, uh, our CPA, our internal auditor. Um, Good evening, um, again, I'm uh, Ms. Chattel, CPA, internal auditor, presenting for adoption of resolution number 40-2024, accepting the fuel audit. Any motion from council to approve resolution 40-2024? Second. Second. Any discussion? 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, I did a fuel audit of uh, two components, uh, one the, the WEX card and then the other the fuel at the roads division. Um, and basically, the um, I'm, I'm upgrading. So in the past, it's been satisfactory. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's been um, adequate rather than satisfactory. I'm upgrading the roads audit, uh, the roads pumps audit to uh, satisfactory, while the um, the WEX card is going to remain adequate. And it's not that the the, the system needs to be up, upgraded or updated, but the department is doing as much as they can to make sure that uh, data is being reported accurately. And so there's a lot of manpower being used, and they're um, they're, they're doing everything that they can do. So that's kind of like the, the summary of it. Um, and I just wanted to point out a couple of, uh, of small points. Um, for the, the public, yeah. the, the two separate, the two separate means by which we distribute the fuel. One is through the roads division, yes. correct, with pumps on location. Correct. And and I guess maybe they do deliver sometimes if ne if need be. But they, they'll deliver to the airport, and then they deliver to. Um, or, or it's not that roads delivered solid waste of it delivers, but through their tanker. It's delivered, yeah. And yeah, and yeah. the second one is the Wex card, which is actually a card that employees use. Correct, and, they, and the, those uh, employees are using it at regular public gas stations. So whereas you and I might use like our bank card or our credit card, then the uh, Wacomico County employees will use the WEX card. And your responsibility was make sure that, that to, to, to test the efficiency of both operations. Yeah, to test the controls. Controls, okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, but, but yeah, ultimately I do wanna improve efficiencies as well. Just, um, <clears throat> so, um, I put a couple of snapshots in here. One, there was a concerns. I've heard rumors and so forth about like you know Delaware car, Wacomico County cars in Delaware. So I put that that image in here. I didn't actually like do any testing about like you know if it was approved or not approved. But I just wanted to put it in there for um, for you to see um, that there's not a, a, a terrible amount, but there there is some Delaware activity, um, and and that could be because you know we we are on the border and there could be things that we have to do in Delaware and and so forth. Um, on the next page, there's also an image that shows uh, the departments that are using the pumps at roads division. And, and this is in here because the department gave me a cost um, analysis that they did for the savings that would occur if uh, departments use their fuel versus the uh, fuel with like the wax card in the public. And so this is kind of like highlighting those departments that are you know trying to improve those efficiencies um, in, in terms of our purchases of fuel. And then there's uh, three tables that go through the WEX purchases, roads divisions, and the combined fuel usage. And um, and there was a concern, you know, that the roads division it's um, uh, more fuel, um, but then the gallons average is a little bit more than with the WEX card, and that's because the diesel fuel is more expensive. So I just just today I looked at the market rates just to give you an example it, in the public. Uh, regular market prices for uh, regular fuel, regular un, uh, unleaded fuel is three dollars and fifty-five cents, whereas diesel fuel today is four dollars and twelve cents. So that average is because that roads division is uh, ninety-five percent diesel. And then uh, just to clarify that that of that, then there's um, overall there's sixty percent of. Uh, off-road diesel, so it's not taxed, and then 35% is taxed because it's going to be going into a vehicle that's going to be driving on the roads. For instance, those tankers that are going to the airport, that tanker is on the road, but then, the, the so, so for the driving of it, but then the, the gas inside that tanker that's going to be delivered to the airport is off-roads, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, so there's three main uh, findings and recommendations. The um, tank capacity be entered into the system and that the VIN numbers be checked. Um, and I figured, I, I learned that if you uh, take a VIN number and there's a certain database I can plug into that VIN number and I can actually get information about that vehicle. So even if it's not readily available for, or feasible for somebody to physically go look at a car, they can just plop that VIN number in and get what that tank capacity is, what kind of fuel that should be that then can be entered into the system. So whoever does this doesn't actually have to go looking at all the cars. <laughs> um, for the odometer, uh, there's a policy that we're supposed to be using logs. It doesn't seem to be done, and it's, it's consistently not done. Um, so uh, there was a recommendation about um, about the using the logs. The um, 
there's a new policy in the back, um, and, and it's it's much prettier in, perfect, in person. When I did a screenshot, it looked kind of blurry, and I apologize. The department's uh, policy looks excellent. I just want to give a you know good shout out to um, the purchasing department that spent a lot of time making that. I just was not good at screenshotting that in. Um, so, so they're, they've developed a policy regarding um, the uh, odometer logs as well as the reviewing. And so that was my third recommendation that there's periodic review by management. So they, um, they, wanted, they, they will implement a management review. In the enhancements section, there's that the fuel upgrade is, is, is recommended. Um, and, and these are enhancements because I don't think there's any fraud or any malfeasance or anything like that, but these are just things that would improve the efficiencies to the county. Um, and then uh, I, I noticed in the bidding documents the, uh, or, or in the actual uh, fuel delivery, um, there, and, and this is something that the department shared with me, so it's not my finding. They volunteered and they showed me all these uh, invoices um, and the deliveries uh, sometimes said uh, net delivered, or sorry, net gallons, and some said gross gallons. There's actually a difference there. It's a price difference. And, um, and some of these theories behind that, they're only the... the uh, the benefit to us for, for either version would only be there if the, the, uh, the company that was delivering it was consistently billing us at that same type of fuel. So uh, part of the recommendation is that they look at these invoices um, every month and make sure that they're um, deliver that, that, that they're charging us on one or the other consistently throughout the year because you can get a benefit in one version or the other depending off its cold weather or hot weather. Um, and then also to consider that in uh, the, it's, it's one factor, not the factor, but, but when deciding on uh, when to buy fuel, looking at the, the prices, because sometimes they could be cyclical. Um, and then the bid documents um, to be updated. And the department has, in the back, they've uh, responded, and um, they're in agreement, and they've uh, put information regarding their progress and um, in, in make, completing all these recommendations. And um, do I have? Do you have any questions for me? Okay. You had mentioned that um, there were some issues, such as information that needed to be completed, such as tank capacity, et cetera, yes. that, that that had not been they, that had not been done addressed. Um, and uh, but it is something that the uh, department is working on, trying to improve. Yes. Yeah, so the purchasing department, there there was a, a complete change over in staff. Um, so the person who's in charge now was not in charge when the former internal auditor made these recommendations before. And I think that knowledge sharing wasn't passed on between the, the former and the current um, purchasing department person. And issues such as filling out VIN numbers? R right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what about the the system itself? Well, the VIN numbers were in the system. Um, there, there might have been one or two that had a typo, but but the, the VIN numbers were in there. Just the fuel capacity wasn't. Okay, thanks. Um, where do you think we're headed as far as the the WEX system is concerned? Because I know you said it was only adequate, um, and it, it probably should be better than it's an automated system. So it should be more efficient, in your your opinion. So. Um, it, there's a there's a continuous audit on P cards, right? Um, because there it, there's a high susceptibility to f frauds and so forth. So I think that the cards automatically are going to have that inherent like risky nature because they could be used anywhere. As you could see in the report, they could be used in Delaware easily. They could be used at midnight. They could be used, you know, in regular working hours. And so it's. Uh, it's something that we need to, in my opinion, have more controls for because it's it's more susceptible to risk and abuse. Okay. Um, but I think that the department's working towards getting there with the um, management review. If, if management reviews these every month um, to make sure that the purchases are reasonable at the department level, then that would mitigate risk. The uh, the logs is that uh, that's those are that's when you're driving the vehicle, like you just write in the miles and the time and everything, and that's mm -hmm. just not being done is what you're saying? Well, it, it is being done in, in some departments and, and others. Uh, it's, it's not, like, I, I didn't really test to it, so I can't say that it's more or less in one particular department, but there were enough instances of people saying to me that they weren't doing it, that I didn't think it was worth it to actually test. What's the purpose of the logs? It, I mean. So the um, there's a... There's an IRS um, rule somewhere, and I, I don't—I didn't put it in the the audit report, so I might not speak to this perfectly. Um, but 
it, when uh, people are you know doing tax things that they that, that they have these fuel records uh, these logs and that like supports that usage um, and I think that's where that, that original thought came from with the county's um, reasoning for the fuel because it's in their personnel manual so so any of the discussion that happened to decide to have whatever the phrasing is that's in there um, I'm not really sure I can't really speak to that too much um, yeah, that's fine we, we do have, I mean, there are receipts, there's transactions. I got you. Um, for the fuel, but, but in terms of the law, yeah, it could improve. Yeah, I, yep. didn't, I didn't see anything in here about DEF, D-E-F. Yes, DEF. Um, I, I, I didn't think that it was a material, it, so, so DEF, it's, it's something, and, and they, they talked to me about it. We, we had lengthy discussion about it in, in one visit. It's a product that's put into the the uh, diesel fuel into the into the vehicle somehow to make sure that it doesn't um, like uh, solidify it, it, in cold weather. It's an anti. No, that's or, not what or, it is. It's an anti-pollution. Yeah. Okay, anti-pollution. Yeah, and yeah. it's added. And your newer diesel, well, newer diesel vehicles have it, and I'm sure most of ours do now. But um, you know, it's it's quite expensive, and I think in the future that needs okay. to be looked at as far as um. The usage and you know comparisons. So, I, I will include DEF in the next report, um, and and I will be doing another audit next year. I, I'd like to get to the point that I'm doing these every other year, but until I have until we have like two consistent satisfactory reports, I I, I want to still do this every year. So so next year I will include DEF and it should be it should be um, audited the same way gasoline okay. or diesel. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I noticed that you had stated throughout the text that um, that there should be either a fuel master upgrade, I guess, with the current system, with the current vendor, or else we should look for a new fuel uh, supply vendor. Yes. Uh, from, re from reading this report, it looks like we should probably be looking for a new vendor. Um, I was very concerned over the fact that there was such a uh, an imbalance in reference to how they were <coughs> Uh, billing the county for either gross gallons or net gall or net gallons. This is a situation where I guess maybe a tanker could have a different series of gallons based simply on whether it's hot or cold weather. Yes. And that's the distinction between whether it's a gross or a net. And it appeared to me that there are enough instances in your in your report that we weren't getting consistency in that. That was what it looked like to me. Um, and the the part of their the inconsistency um, to them might be that the confusion about what were what they were supposed to be doing and I, I don't know I, I don't want to get in, into um, uh, talking negatively about Actually. specific vendors or not but but I, I know that the, the the bidding documents have been um, updated and and they likely will I mean I, I can't speak for, for what the department's going to do in terms of bidding for future but um, the, the, it definitely was I agree with you a, a serious concern about whether it was going to be net gallons um, and so hopefully that'll be resolved uh, for the future, and and that's partly why we should have them why, why they should look at the bills every month to make sure that it's correct. Yeah, yeah. I, I I thought it was very interesting that the whole read, and, and I think you really found a lot of inconsistencies that that we certainly do need to look at, and maybe a whole entire change of plans in reference to the uh, to the vendors. Yeah, and and just to clarify uh, that there's there's two different vendors here. Uh, one, the one that's delivering the fuel that that with the net gallons versus um, the gross, and then the other vendor is the one that um, the data gets uploaded to the system. So f for the roads pumps data, um, it, it's some sort of like the, the the data just doesn't get uploaded. That's a different vendor than the one that actually delivers the fuel. But yeah. Either way, I think Either way, yeah. it, was a very, it was a very insightful report uh, or audit. I thought it was very valuable uh, in, in, uh, with the information that you supplied. Any other questions? No. All those in favor of uh, resolution number 40-2024 say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's carried. Resolution passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, at this time, we open the floor for public comments. If you have any public comments you'd like to make come to the podium, please state your name, your county residence, and concern. Keep in mind, we're trying to stay within the three-minute limit. Jim Atkins, Wacomico County. Uh, I want to talk about the uh, volunteer firefighters 
property tax exemption and what's been going on with that. Uh, a lot of hard work's been done by the council. Still a lot of questions or some questions out there. And uh, I decided to do a little bit of research after we've had the president of the auxiliary for Wacomico County speak to us. We've had the president of the Wacomico County Volunteer Firemen's Association speak to us. And we've had the administration tell us that what we're asking is not possible. Uh, if you go into the national, and Councilman Merritt has a, has a form there uh, passed out, National Volunteer Fire Council, Volunteer Responder Incentive Protection Act, House Resolution 1241 and Senate Resolution 1210. First paragraph states the Volunteer Responder Incentive Protection Act allows communities to provide volunteer firefighters and EMS personnel with property tax reductions and or up to $600 per year of recruitment and retention incentives without these benefits being subject to federal income tax withholding. Okay. That's from that National Volunteer Firemen's Council. If you go to the second page, you have the legislative victory, which was passed on December the 21st of 2020. One of the four people who supported this bill was Maryland Senator Ben Cardin. They passed a permanent, the House and Senate, passed a permanent extension of the Volunteer Responder Incentive Protection Act, which exempts nominal recruitment and retention benefits that volunteer emergency responders receive from being subject to federal income tax and reporting requirements. Okay. I'm not going to read the rest of the page to you. You can read that on your own time because we are trying to stick to three minutes. But I will go to the last page, if you would, please, and you'll see a little asterisk there. Uh, the Volunteer Responders Incentive Program was originally enacted in 2007 and was in effect from 2008 through 2010, expiring in 2011. That version exempted property tax benefits and up to $30 a month of active service or $360 per year and other incentives. Last year, Congress reauthorized that act for the 2020 tax year, but it had been sent to expire on December 31st. This version increased the maximum exemption on non-property tax benefits to $50 per month of active service, or $600 a year. House Resolution 133 retains the tax exemption on property tax benefits and up to $600 in other benefits. It's telling you right here that property tax credit is not taxable. It has been stated that the IRS guidelines say it is. Well, it's been a while since I was in high school, but and they did teach civics back then. I think Congress tells the IRS what they can and can't do. And Congress is saying here that this property tax is, is done. The county executive has stated that she has spoken to the Queen Anne's County executive. Well, I've been in contact with the Queen Anne's County finance director. And his response with me is that everything we are doing, we believe is above the law and above the table. He is the one that provided me with all this information. I guess I try not to get aggravated about it, but we've got an executive, a director of administration, an assistant director of administration, a director of finance, and a whole finance department that wants to tell us that this is taxable. I sit home and spend about three hours total, and I come up with this information. 
It's non-taxable, folks. I've been in contact with Senator Cardin asking him for a full definition of this bill and what the purpose of the bill was. But unfortunately, they're a little busy right now with, with a bridge in Baltimore. So I don't expect to hear from him in the next couple of days. But I don't want to say this isn't my job, but the people I just named in the executive branch, their salaries are $583,000 a year to find the answers to these questions. It's not my job, but here's the answer. Thank you for everything that you've done to support it. Now maybe you can push the executive branch to support it a little bit more. And maybe the Volunteer Firemen's Association will realize that uh, everything they're being told is not the way life is. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Very much. Thank you. Good evening, Holly Ortel, president of the Wicomico County Fire Association. I want to thank you, and please, may I have a copy of that? Thank you. I want to thank you gentlemen and uh, lady um, for all of your support with the Fire Association. It is gre greatly appreciated. Um, I understand that we are fighting with the county executive and the finance committee about the tax credit. Um, with this 1099, I uh, wholeheartedly believe what you're saying. I am fighting for it. I have been in uh, contact with um, Congressman Andy Harris's office and um, Councilman Baker, Councilman Merritt, um, and Chief Twilley down at Willard's. Um, I need to get a letter um, written. He already knows what's going on, so I can get in there. Um, I feel like I'm pulling tooth and nail. When I did my research, um, as a few of you councilmen know, and I contacted Queen Anne's County, Calvert County, and Arundel County. Calvert County was the first county in the state of Maryland to start the real estate tax credit, 2,500. No one else is giving a 1099. We're not employees of y'all, we're volunteers. Um, when I contacted um, our county executive, um, she made a phone call to Queen Anne's County and um, she brought my name into it. And she was like, well, you know, Holly Wirtel said X, Y, Z that you all aren't doing this. And she had the audacity to let them know that they are doing it wrong. Um, she doesn't need to worry about Queen Anne's County whether they're doing it right, wrong, or indifferent. That's nobody's business. Her business is here in Wicomico County. But I do thank you all for all of your support. I ask for your continued support. I appreciate all you councilmen coming out to um, our meetings every month. And um, hopefully at our next meeting, um, we'll be voting once to have it at 7 o'clock versus 7.30. <laughs> so uh, that'll be much better thank for God. all of us. And I hope to see you guys in... Uh, Fruitland, and um, I'll keep on fighting for this uh, tooth and nail that we're not paying um, a $30 tax credit on a tax credit. Um, that's just silliness in my eyes, but thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sortel. Hi, my name is James Dahlien, and I live on Shadow Lane in Del Mar, Maryland. I'm a husband, father of five, Eagle Scout, software engineer, uh, gaming, fishing, hiking, frisbee, and outdoor enjoyer. I'd like to briefly comment on two subjects. First, I've been participating in the Wacomico Clean uh, Roadside Trash Cleanup Group the last couple of weeks. Uh, Mark Engberg and Bruce Robson have been doing a great job recruiting volunteers every weekend to clean up Wacomico. I urge the executive, council, and community to keep supporting this movement. Second, I'm here to voice my opposition to the Safari at the Quarry off-road events scheduled to be run at the Connolly Mill property this year and beyond. When I moved here about two years ago, my realtor said there was a park planned for the property nearby to my home. Now, after hearing about these events on Facebook, it prompted me to start reading through several minutes from open work sessions and meetings from this county. 
I found a long history of public discussion and engagement uh, for turning this property into a recreational park. These Safari at the Quarry off-road events put a foot in the door and set to destroy this long-term plan. Where were the public hearings and community engagement on this change of plans? There are a lot of remarks about Safari at the Quarry being a one-time event, and there shouldn't be any concern. I disagree. Here's a few excerpts from the event's website and Facebook page that contradict such statements. We are going to build a community of 4x4 culture around this amazing facility. Please share this page and help to build our Safari community, 274 acres of fun and 4x4 enjoyment. We are supportive of ATVs and will continue to work towards something that segment for that segment of the community. The initial focus will be short wheelbase vehicles. It's only just the beginning. This will be our first event at the Safari at the Quarry location. July, to be announced, 2024, open wheeling at the Quarry, our second event. We are looking to have two to three this year. Please help restore the original intent of this property. Save Connolly Mill Park. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Between the two of us will be much less than six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm here tonight to speak to you about the future of Connolly Mill Park. And let us know who you are. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Mikhail Darlene, <laughs> Shadow <you>. Hills. <laughs> I'm here tonight to speak to you about the future of Connolly Mill Park. While the county grapples with the controversies surrounding the Safari at the Quarry events, I believe the most critical <clears throat> issue is being overlooked, the original vision for the park itself. This land was gifted to all Wacomico County residents, and the vision for Connolly Mill Park was clear. The county's own Natural Resource Conservation Advisory Committee, NRCAC, Recreation, parks, and tourism, local groups, and many residents work to shape a plan for low-impact uses like hiking, water sports, biking, and more. In 2017, the NRCAC explicitly stated their support for this vision in a letter to the County Council and former, former County Executive Bob Culver. Here is an excerpt from that letter. Our committee has discussed the importance of this area in great detail and we are very excited to have heard of the potential donation and acquisition of the property for the county. We would like for you to accept this letter as an understanding of full and complete support of the NRCAC for the proposed donation. Providing enjoyment and use of the property with a low impact development plan would provide not only additional recreational opportunities for the county, but equally as important, protection for the paleo aquifer and the headwaters of the Wacomico River. Our committee is in full support of the acceptance of the property and willing and able to provide insight and recommendations on a responsible, low-impact use of the property. Ironically, the initial donation was delayed due to contamination. Later, environmental testing performed by Heinz and Associates revealed that the contamination most likely resulted from illegal ATV use, which is going on <coughs> to this day every day. The county recognized the opportunity to mitigate the damage with a low-impact part. The original vision continues to be important. Conley Mill is part of the Tri-County Council's comprehensive economic development strategy, listed as a project under their goal of vibrant communities from 2022 to 2024. This goal seeks to protect the environment while offering diverse recreation. The development of Conley Mill Park has been included in every Wacomico County capital improvement program since its donation in 2019 promising multiple opportunities for public input and engagement regarding future plans for the property. Suddenly this year, Connolly Mill Park has disappeared from the CIP submitted by Madam Executive on December 19, 2023, without any of the promised public input or engagement. Instead, the County Executive has signed a deal with a private business granting them 90% of gross revenue, while the County would only receive 10% of net profits. That deal contradicts the NRCAC's advice, disregards the community-driven vision, and flies in the face of all previous discussions and decisions regarding the Connolly Mill property. The county executive claims this is only one event. However, the company's own website calls the event a venue launch and touts extensive plans for a 274-acre off-road park. Let me reiterate, Connolly Mill Park, a space envisioned for all residents to enjoy 
is on the verge of becoming a playground for a select few, and all of this is happening without any public input. We must act now to protect the original vision. By following the recommendations of the NRCAC and fulfilling the goals outlined in the Tri-County Council strategy, we can create a park that serves the entire region. Let us stand together and ensure that Conley Mill Park becomes a park for all, not a privilege for a few. Thank you. And this is my daughter, Fiona. You just can't say your name. No, just say your name. <laughs> Hello, Fiona. Go ahead. <laughs> My name is Fiona, and I'm here to talk about how Safari at the Quarry has affected me. When I first moved here, I heard about a park that they were making, and I was very excited about it. I was very excited to hang out with my friends at a park. Now I have been hearing ATVs in my backyard all the time. They are loud and obnoxious, and I have no peace and quiet because of them. I am afraid that because of this, there will be no park. I know this is a beautiful place, and it would be sad if my dream of the park did not come true. Everybody deserves to enjoy this place. Thank you. Good job, Fiona. Future councilwoman. <laughs> Put that on her coming in. I can't follow that act very easily, can I? I'm a, good evening. I'm Mike Goldberg. I reside in uh, Del Mar in the Shadow Hill subdivision. I'm speaking this evening in regard to the off-road vehicle events safari at the quarry to take place at the proposed Connolly Mill site in Del Mar. As we're all aware, the county executive, Julie Giordano, single-handedly entered into a contract with Livewire Media to stage multiple off-road vehicle events at the Connolly Mill property. And I do mean multiple events, as they were specifically provided for in the contract and are being widely adver advertised by Livewire on social media. As we're also aware, this was done without public notice, without opportunity for public comment, and without the advice and consent of the County Council. Equally as concerning, none of the appropriate due diligence was undertaken prior to executing the agreement to examine economic and financial impacts, county expenditures, traffic control, and fire safety issues, uh, as well as environmental impacts. The contract itself is ridden with ambiguities, inequities, and legal pitfalls that place county taxpayers at a distinct disadvantage. Essentially, the county executive jumped without looking. The memorandum of, of understanding was not an arm's length contract, as the county executive has admitted to being long acquainted with Livewire's principal, Brad Hoffman. Additionally, the terms of the contract are already being disregarded with the tacit approval of the county executive, including the unauthorized use of environmentally sensitive parcel 168. Every Wicomico County resident should find these circumstances to be deeply concerning. As others have revealed this evening, the off-road events also violate the long intended use of the Connolly Mill property as a low impact park that should be available to all area residents, not just to, to the selected few who pay substantial sums to Livewire in order to, uh, to participate. Ultimately, all Wicomico County residents and taxpayers have been kept in the dark and were completely disenfranchised from the process particularly the most impacted stakeholders who live in the immediate area. It's disturbing that through a loophole in the county charter, the county executive is empowered to enter into contracts in such an injudicious manner. But I believe there are several avenues of legisl le legislative action available to the county council that will serve to rein in the county executive as necessary to prevent further misuse of her authority. One. While understanding that the county council cannot be overburdened with reviewing and approving the hundreds of contracts that are executed each year, please consider legislation that would require the council to approve all contracts other than those that involve the Civic Center. It's my understanding that most contracts are for the use of the Civic Center, and by excluding them from council approval, the potential burden should be significantly reduced. Since the Connolly Mill Park is purportedly exempt from Salisbury's uh, zoning ordinance and perhaps nuisance ordinances when used for public events, 
please consider legislation that would limit use of the property to non-disruptive events, whether public or private, unless the county council approves. Also, please consider legislation that would grant special status to the Con Connolly Mill Park site and any other uh, specifically designated county-owned properties that have environmental or neighborhood concerns. This would deny the county executive the authority to enter into contracts or leases without the council's consent, thereby affording such properties and surrounding neighborhoods with the necessary protections. Additionally, we asked the County Council to obtain a formal, formal legal opinion from the Council's attorney determining, one, whether the memorandum of understanding is interpreted to be a contract or instead a lease, and two, whether the planned off-road events are considered to be a public use or a private use. We believe the answers to these questions must be settled prior to taking legislative action as they will determine the applicability of city or county zoning codes, noise or nuisance ordinances, or other applicable codes and ordinances, and will provide some clarity as to the best paths forward. It has become clear that too much power has been vested in the office of the county executive under the current charter. No citizen of Wicomico County should be deprived of the quiet enjoyment of their homes or suffer diminishment of property values at the whim of a single individual who exercises power recklessly and without regard for the human consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldberg. Good evening. I'm Heather Langford. Um, first and foremost, I do want to thank you for the Wacomico cleanup. That's an effort that we're working with Mr. Enberg and Wacomico Clean. So I really appreciate that. Um, I am only here to state some factual information as the engineer and to clarify a few items. Um, I understand uh, Shadow Hill's stance, but as the engineer um, and some of the regulatory items, I just do want to clarify a few things. I was looking through the petition and the uh, website that was created. There were a few facts. Um, fact number one stated public purpose. Um, it is quoted, and I do believe there's a misconception of this phrase when it comes to the planning and zoning aspect. Maryland State Governing Zoning Decisions Regulatory Guidelines per case law states, and state and counties interchangeable, where the state leases its property to a private organization for a public purpose, munic municipal zoning and permit laws cannot be imposed to regulate the use of the property. Public use is not synonymous with physical use or access by the general public. It is then stated that the public par park development for the use of all citizens has th been, thereby been terminated. To clarify, the sale of the property was outlined as use for recreational purposes and to mine soil for use at the landfill. To terminate something, it must first exist. No public park development was designed after, after the approved sale in Resolution 2018-146. Fact number four mentions SEDS panel, and the Executive Giordano sits on the SEDS committee. I respectfully would like to add that Mr. Cannon, Mr. Wynn, Mr. Merritt, Ms. Shields, Mr. Baker, Mr. Holloway, Mr. Hastings, and Ms. Hurley are also on that committee, with four of the council members being voting members. Fact seven claims that Jeeps are driving off trails directly through natural tall grasses, home to many wildlife creatures. We have had three state authorities and one federal authority review this concern. All anonymous complaints were found to be in compliance. Additionally, the tall grass that is not on the trail is the grass within the LOD of the pit we have permitted. This area can be dug out for soils to use at the landfill, which would and or will require removal of the grass. Fact eight states that the flyer available on safariatthequarry.com states, quote, we are expecting 400 to 500 vehicles, over 1,000 spectators slash participants, end quote. This was found on the vendor page as stated in, on the website. It is highlighting how many vehicles may be at the vendor zone as headlined in the flyer. The vendor zone is not at Conley Mill and is shown on, at the location on the flyer. The fact that Mr. Hoffman's company was one of the nation's most successful Jeep festivals with so many numbers of Jeeps has no bearing on this event. Rather, it shows how successful and drama-free his events are in these locations. Fact number 11 is an attempt to state that taxpayers' expenditures related to this event include personal hours, 
police support for traffic control, roll fencing, manpower and equipment to assist the, with event setup, and marketing support. To date, the county has overestimated approximately $1,064 has been spent for the event by the county. Furthermore, due to anonymous complaints to local, state, and federal authorities, which was unwarranted and solidified compliance of the county, the county has had to spend man hours, which, was, which has led up to $2,000 in council meetings and adjustments that cost another $2,900 approximately, totaling near $5,000 for those who have for completing these items that were already done for the site's compliance, yet the county was challenged by those who voiced these authorities and their unhappiness with the Jeep event and for it to be canceled. The county does not make the obstacle course, have rolled fencing, or do marketing support as claimed in the petition. This is all live wire media financially supported. Next, there was mention of contaminants and soils after vehicles crawl through it. As the jurisdictions noted in their findings, the trails are located in areas surrounded by uplands, not allowing for any discharge outside of the LOD. These same vehicles and those that do have modifications to exhausts and other items may also have contaminants on the roadways and driveways throughout all communities. A few clarifications on what was claimed to be egregious. I wanna clarify that we are not an active mining site and MSHA has noted there is no jurisdiction over the site because it does not qualify as one. Additionally, we have a mining exemption permit. The par parcel is not landlocked as stated. It does have a 50 foot right, right of way which nullifies private property or pu public property. Hauling trucks utilize this road frequently which also alleviates any concerns that fire vehicles and police cannot adequately access, access this site. No conflicts have arisen from calls we have made when trespassing has occurred between jurisdictional authorities. The petition noted hundreds of thousands of Jeeps having active recalls for engine fires. Ironically, there are multiple households within Shadow Hills that have Jeeps parked near the woods line. I get confused because in one hand, police can't make it back via the road. Invaluable police time and effort is lost. And it is also noted that there's a long history of illegal access and use. In one instance, there's the want for more people there, in another there's a desire for no people there. In one area, abuse of valuable police time and effort is noted, but county employees vesting time, meeting local, state, and federal authorities, some driving two and a half hours away, are not considered valuable and misused. I read the environmental concerns brought up per Merlin Maps on the website. Almost each claim of the concern also had Shadow Hills community fall in the same concerning areas. This includes Palustrian wetlands, wetland buffer over the HOA stormwater easement, Maryland amphibian and reptile, nearly every parcel in Bionet tier five significant for biodiversity conservation, targeted, targeted ecological areas, green infrastructure hub and corridors and more. Lastly, Shadow Hills development was built on lots within the 100 year flood pain, cut down existing wood lines and forest conservations, but we allowed for economic development and growth within the county. And I hope we can do the same here. I have any documents that anybody would like to, to see. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lyford. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Michelle Wright. I live in Hebron, Maryland, and this is probably going to be the shortest speech I've ever given at a county council meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just wanted to come and say thank you. Oh, thank, you. Um, thank you for finding the money to keep Fruitland Primary School going. I understand it passed with a 4-3 vote, and I understand the discussion was about where the money was going to come from, and that caused some of the decisions to not pass unanimously, but I am very thankful that um, it is moving forward. Um, and I wanted to thank publicly, because I don't get to do that very often either, Sheriff Mike Lewis and the work that's done in the state's attorney's office, Jamie Dykes, um, they don't give enough rec recognition for what they do and what they have to put up with. And I just want to say thank you publicly to them as well. So thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Good evening, everybody. Um, I don't have anything prepared either and uh, we'll be as brief as possible. I think we could continue to debate back and forth with the county and with the residents forever. You know, the intent is well documented in eight years worth of records, your records, 
our community has poured over them and extracted tons and tons of minutes. Um, you know, we feel pretty strongly of the intent of the donor of whether it's restricted in the deed or not. Um, the intent is there for what was supposed to be done with that. The removal of that property from the SEDS document with the Tri-County Council and the CIP is an enormous waste of time and resources of a lot of people. If we want to get down to like nickel and diming, who's done what and a thousand dollars the county spent on this. I mean, if we t tallied up the number of hours the people in this community have worked and the jobs, the things they haven't done with their jobs, like we could go on and on. You know, I think it's kind of ridiculous and we're losing the point. <laughs> the point is there's a lot of documentation that that was intended and should have been a public park. Right? It, it has been removed. I spoke to Mr. Padgham myself. I understand it was removed very recently that it was proposed to be removed in October and maybe removed officially in January from the SEDS document. And that does coincide with, you know, the agendas of the executive to conduct these other events. Um, we do feel it flies in the face of, of what the property was intended to be. And I think the council has mostly stood behind that. Um, there's plenty to read if somebody wants, I, I suppose, to dig through like Mikkel has done and you know read all the documentation. There's lots of it out there, um, including the documentation that Heinz and Associates, I think, Mr. Smethurst maybe even read that. Was that Mr. Smethurst that read that at a council meeting that um, Heinz and Associates believed that the contamination that existed was from 15 years of illegal and illicit ATV use? I didn't make that up. That came from your own minutes. Okay, why on earth we would even be considering repeating these events and concentrating them into short periods of time literally doesn't make any sense. Like, you own the property. You know it had contamination from that already. Somebody decided at some point it wasn't bad enough to accept the donation. But the first time around, it was rejected because it was a worry. Somebody decided it wasn't bad enough. Now we're talking about repeating it over and over and over. And there are, there's tons of documents out there if you want to read um, scientific papers about ATV parks and compaction of soil and contamination. I mean, we could take forever to do that. But the facts are, there's already facts on the record that this was a problem. Why would we even, why would we even conceive of allowing that and promoting it? You know, that's just, I'm, I'll leave that topic there because it, it is what it is. It doesn't make any sense to allow something like this to continue. You know, we respectfully ask that the MOU be canceled, that the events be terminated before further damage is done. Because even if we say, let it happen, let's just see, um, if it doesn't go well, we won't do it again, I don't think that's a good enough answer, okay? And if my teenager said that to me, I'd say, absolutely not. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, the answer is definitely no. You know it's a problem when you have to say it that way. <laughs> so, you know, if we want to reinstill the park later, there's already damage. There's further damage that's going to be done. You do one event out there, okay? And maybe Ms. Engineer and everybody, can, we can argue about facts of how much contamination. You know there was contamination on the site from the ATVs and the motorcycles. And that spread across a few vehicles out there over 15 years. You already have a bigger problem. Since they've advertised this, they're in our neighborhoods now. Even yesterday, somebody's got videos of the Jeeps driving through our neighborhood. Guess who comes running inside when my kids, it was Easter Sunday. I had to call the cops on Easter. Look, I like to be the quiet one in the room, not the loud one. But this has crossed the line. Like, Easter Sunday, I'm doing my Easter egg hunt. Guess what happens? There's raging ATVs all so loud in the yard. My kids come running inside and say, Mom, it sounds like we're coming in our yard today. So, you know, somebody has videos of seven of them just ripping and roaring back there. And so, of course... Do I want to call the cops and bother them on Sunday? No. Did we do it? Yes, because we're told, well, you should call. That way you can get it on the record. That's a problem. Fine, I'll do that. Okay. I'll, s several other people already called before me. Cops come to my cul-de-sac. Here I'm literally putting my Easter eggs out, and I've got the police in my driveway. Like, that looked great when my nieces and nephews pulled up, you know? And I couldn't change the timing. It is what it is. You know, the police officer came, um, County Sheriff Baker, you know, I apologize for even having to call because I don't want to waste resources. But he said, please call us. This is such a problem. We want you to call every time. And he said to me, I can't get back there. I can pull in. I can't get through the gate. All I can do is pull up. Sometimes they see us. Sometimes they leave. He said, we'd like to arrest people, but we can't. We can't access it. 
So, you know, it's a constant problem. It is increasing. The Jeeps circling our cul-de-sac and staring at our kids in the yard. You know, I bought my house with a big yard so my kids can play outside and have a great time and feel safe. Not so I can have people stalking my yard trying to see if they can get to the pits now. And that is something that's been increasing since this advertising's going on. So we just ask that you please, you know, see the benefit in standing up for what's right, what's been documented that should have happened, and take a stand on this. I don't know what has to happen, but we would like to see much further action than what we're seeing. And there are neighborhoods close to us that don't know any, ha have not been informed about this either, who are now being informed. Wood Creek has 304 homes. They are very nearby to this community as well. They have their HOA meeting tonight. They are discussing amongst the homeowners tonight the, this revelation that unfortunately they also had no knowledge of. Um, does it impact them that they're next door? No. Does it impact the community because the park is the, for the benefit of all these people? Yes. You know, there are massive apartment buildings within minutes of that park. You have tons, thousands of kids in those apartments, people, older people who need a place to walk. That's what it's supposed to be for. That's why the um, why Kamoko County, if I can get the Natural Resource Advisory Committee, wrote the letter they wrote endorsing that donation. And that is on the record. Mikkel mentioned it. Um, I think you can get further input from them at this point. You sought their input, or their input was sought along with ours at the time of the donation. We were approached and asked to endorse that the donation be accepted upon the understanding that this would be borrow pits and a public park. And now they're flying in our face and saying, sorry, that's just not what we're going to do. And we haven't even addressed the fact that the misleading information that continues to be presented, including at our last meeting, that this is just 200 Jeeps, that it's just one weekend. It is well documented in the MOU that this is an ongoing event. It is all over their websites that they want to build a facility out of this. The MOU states reasons for producing a series of events each year. The information is all there. We cannot just ignore it. Thank you. Get her name. She was right. It was Holly Campbell. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Craig Stofko, um, retired director of Department of Health for Somerset County. Retired six years ago. Uh, I will try not to repeat anything that's already been said. It's kind of hard to do with same issues. Uh, one thing I, I think is worth mentioning anyway is that Comco County is the only county in Maryland without a state park. These discussions go back probably 10 years. I, I remember talking with Mayor Day about it, Tri-County Council. Uh, before this land became available, we were talking about where, where we could do it. So it predates even, even the time frame that, that's being addressed. Um, one of the other things that I'm sure has, has raised some eyebrows, that this event, the proposed site, sits directly on top of our cleanest, if not our only, source of water. Uh, I would direct you to articles by Dr. Sukasa Uzama, A-Z-U-M-A, and articles written on science.com, among others. And they detail the effects of exhaust from automobiles and how they contaminate water and soil in, in addition to, I'm not minimizing air pollution, but some of what they describe are the heavy particulate matter and volatile organic compounds that are too heavy to just float up in the air. They settle in the soil and get absorbed into, into our water system. Uh, on the DNR site, you can see where the elevation of that site is higher than, than the surrounding area. It's, it exceeds 50 feet. And then less than, less than five miles downstream, in the Pemberton area, it's one foot above sea level. So in less than five miles, it, it descends more than 50 feet. So all the stuff going into that groundwater and those four streams that feed directly into the Wacomico River 
add to the pollution, which I, I, I was kind of appalled to see this because I thought it had been addressed. I saw this today. Um, Googled Wacomico River pollution without doing anything else. Wacomico River, boom. Wacomico River is mired in filth. Levels of fecal bacteria are at the highest levels ever recorded. Swimming is not safe due to contamination. I, I know there's only so much people can do, but this to me seems like such a huge step backwards. It, it's hard to believe it's, it's even being considered. The last thing I'll, I'll say has to do with the MOU, having been a health officer for many years. Uh, I've written dozens of MOUs. I've signed hundreds, thousands. When I first saw this MOU, I, I thought it was a rough draft. I don't say I thought it was a joke, but I thought it was a rough draft. Um, when I realized it wasn't, I, I reviewed it and, and still amazed and, and contend that it's the most shabby piece of work I've ever seen in my life. But that notwithstanding, when you look at the, their own numbers, this MAU is set up so that one person is set to gain somewhere in the vicinity of $100,000 where I find it impossible that the county can can break even on this, but I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and, and say so they do, the county gets zero. So an MOU is set up where one individual is gonna make 100 grand, the county gets nothing. As a health officer, I always operated under if there's even the potential to be perceived conflict of interest, shut it down. Potential for perceived conflict of interest. And here we have a guy whose only qualification of using taxpayer funded land and equipment is that he's longtime friends with the county executive. I just think that's absurd. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stofko. Any other public comments? Good evening, Lisa Collier Purnell, and I also reside in Shadow Hills. My comments will be brief because I feel horrible, but I'm not contagious. But this just shows you how important this is to us that we press out here and to the young lady who came and talked about the resources i promise you that we have taken leave from work uh, those of us who work elsewhere we have had to take leave to come together and try to stand together on this issue i just want to tell you how deeply saddened i was on resurrection sunday to hear from holly and that what she had to go through and that she had to contact the wacomico county sheriff's department we don't have that type of um, activity in Shadow Hills. But just stop and think as these events continue, more will become aware of that area and we will continue to see that. And that's not what we want. I've been sitting here and I'm not as um, technologically savvy as I'd like to think, but I hope that I'll be able to find it for the next public comment or to share with each of you some comments from some of the individuals who plan to come. And they are so set back and put off by our comments and our disdain for what they're doing that they have said that they're going to come through our development and they're going to be making some more noise. Well, we know that We'll con contact you, Sheriff Lewis, and we're going to let them know. And what, what do we have to continue to enjoy the peace that we want in our neighborhoods that each of you have and every other Wicomico County citizen should have? That, that's horrible. Um, so we're, you know, we've been called, as you heard the last time. I, you know, I said I was going to be brief, but here I am with a mic. They tell me the same thing about you, Sheriff Lewis. Don't get in front of Mike with him. But here I am. And, um, I love you too. I, yeah. And um, really, we're, we're not entitled. We're not bad citizens. Uh, we're not selfish. We just simply want what is best for the county, not just for Shadow Hills. And again, 
to hear to see those posts on Facebook where they say that they're going to come through our development and they're going to be raising hell that that really concerns us because I'm at the beginning and when you're looking and you look out the window I see young children who are able to ride their bikes who are able to be on their skateboards who are walking with their dogs young people old people we don't want that and we really hope that something can be done as we have asked that this this contract, this memorandum of understanding, agreement, whatever it is, that it can be canceled, it can be canceled, and we can start again. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Cornell. Any other public comments? Seeing none, that concludes public comments. Uh, council comments. Uh, Josh? You guys it out? I'll let you go first. I'll go second. Let me go first. Oh, the woman. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go <Michelle> third. first. <laughs> I think um, that when people have comments, like the neighborhood, the county executive who signed the MOU should be here to hear it. I think that um, even if she didn't agree with the comments, she should have been here to listen to them. I think it's called respect for your county residents. I think it's a serious matter to the county and to the residents that live here are taxpayers. I do not agree with, with what's going on because I have these motorcycles that raise up and coming through Jersey Road, it's like a racetrack. I understand the noise. I also understand the Paleo Channel, the importance of that. Um, I'm surprised environmentalists haven't been here to protest that and contamination. And we talk about, you know, you see the ads on the paper about, uh, was it Fort, what is it? Fort Lejeune or Camp Lejeune, the pollution in the water. We don't know what's gonna happen 15, 10, 15 years from now with this kind of stuff. I remember that they did talk about, when I was on the city council, about a park and then things change. But I think we need to respect the people that live in the community, not some outsider that doesn't live in the community. And I think that also I made a comment um, about the, the bald eagles was um, were endangered species. Well, I was stand corrected by the county exec that it's off the list now, but however, it's protected by the Migratory Bird Tre Treaty Act, the Ball and Golden Eagle Protection Act, and the Lacey Act, and it was declassified as uh, endangered species in 2016. So I'm not too far off. It's still something that you have to consider the, the animals that are in this place that you're going to scare them half to death. You're going to run into people's yards. Oh, you, you don't know if they're rabid animals or what, but they're, you're going to mess with their environment when you bring these people. And I guarantee you that there's going to be a thousand people or more at this event. And I guarantee you, Chief, you're going to be busy that day. I guarantee you. Because people are not going to follow rules and regulations. And it should be some kind of way that we should secure that place so nobody can get in it at this time. It should be a fence or something put around this particular stuff so that people cannot get in anytime because that's not what it's for. Now, if it becomes a park, that's something different. But right now, it should be some kind of secure place so people cannot come and use their ATVs and whatever else they use, drive motorcycles, whatever, to disturb this um, uh, community. And as I said in the last meeting, if I could vote, I would vote to cancel the event if we could if we could do that and if we find a way maybe we can you know I don't know but I would support canceling my personal opinion yeah just uh, three things I want to bring up um, uh, first of all just on the safari the quarry I Second, that I, if we could cancel the event, I certainly think we should. Uh, I am uh, one of the very first votes I took as a council member um, was to accept this property uh, and then to have it be or to be used that to use that property for um, they're going to pull 
soil off of it, and then it was become like, going to become a park. So that's what we were planned for. That's what was, so um, this whole other use is is completely foreign to that. I'm also on the I am I do serve on the Natural Resources Conservation Advisory Committee, and we actually have a meeting on Tuesday. We are going to discuss it a little further um, because those folks uh, um, feel very strongly. You know, they they intentionally went out of their way to support that property for that reason, and that was with um, Mr. Culver, County South Culver, um, before he passed. So I think we should honor the original intent. That's where we should go on that. Um, and yes, if there's a way that we can stop anything currently, I think we should. Um, on the, uh, I did want to point out two other things. Uh, um, the cleanup. Uh, there's a couple, multiple folks, and uh, uh, you have. Um, thank you all for being here too. <laughs> um, who have been involved with uh, the cleanups uh, around the county? Um, there's been multiple individuals who have said uh, we need to make sure that we are helping provide the citizens who want to to clean up a particular street neighbor that they are doing so and that they're safe and that they're supported. Um, you know, and, that, and, then, and then furthermore, that we put signs out in the areas that are the biggest, um, you know, the biggest problem areas. I, I think we, sh I don't know how we are um, addressing that in the budget um, or thinking through that a little bit more, but um, I definitely think that we should uh, put a very concerted efforts to try to get to, the, especially those targeted dumping zones, because um, there's, there's far too many of us that are out there that are trying to do our part to, to, uh, to, to, to clean, but there's, you know, there's just too many, there's a lot of ro roads in Wicomico County um, and, and pardon me, far too uh, few of us that are um, able to, to do all that. Um, and last thing I just want to bring up, uh, it was mentioned, of course, the Fruitland, uh, the vote. Um, I don't know if Mr. if the folks are still here, but uh, um, that was a, Ms., Ms., uh, Michelle Wright uh, mentioned that that was a 4-3 vote. That was just on the amendment. It was a 6-1 vote. Our, you know, we did have a lot of good discussion about Fruitland, uh, trying to make sure that that um, school um, can still move forward and that we're doing it in the judiciously in the right way. The question was how is it funded and how is it paid for? Yeah. I'll pause there. Thank you. Shane. So talking about the safari at the quarry, I think it's time, Mr. President, if we can get it on the agenda to see if we can do legislation which where the council can govern county property and what what events can take place on county property. But there's been so much public outcry, we need to we need to at least entertain it. We can do that. Um, I want to thank Mr. Atkins for all of his information. He calls me, he texts me, he emails me. <laughs> Sometimes I don't respond like I should, but he still gives me a lot of information and I appreciate it. And okay. thank you for coming and, and helping us out. Um, I think the safari at the quarry could have been, could have been a good thing if it was handled appropriately, but it has just spun so out of control with lack of information, lack of public support, lack of a lot of things that at this point, you know, I agree with the other councilmen that I would vote to cancel it as well. It's just, you know, there's been, it's 10 to one, the public outcry against it than for it. I've had a few, maybe two, three calls for it. The rest have been against it. Under to one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 maybe even higher than that, but it, it's time that we do what we can do to address this as a council body. Um, and I want to thank Holly for coming out. Thank you for coming out. That's all I got. Yep. Thanks, buddy. So I'm going to break tradition. I'm not going to talk, talk about the safari <laughs> yet. Um, I do want to recognize uh, Lee Outen, who retired um, this week. He was our superintendent of roads over at Public Works. Um, he literally knows every square inch of the 700 miles of roads that we have in this county. Um, so he will definitely be missed. Um, and we wish him wet, uh, well on his next adventure. Um, I want to recognize Bruce Robson and Mark Engberg, the two uh, guys that have spearheaded this um, cleanup effort. Um, I do speak daily with them, and um, there will be signs out on the next project. Um, they're being designed right now, as a matter of fact. Um, I hope you're not paying for them, Jeff. <laughs> so moving on, um, and, and I want to thank our city and county partners. Uh, Mr. Swaby, thank you. Um, 
city of Salisbury. Uh, this is really a team effort. We, um, we had 20 people out on Johnson Road and Airport Road area mm. on Saturday. Um, we picked up, um, there were so many people, we had to divide into three groups and go in different directions. We, uh, and uh, Jennifer Albero, uh, she calculates everything for us. Uh, we, we picked up 1,650 pounds Jeez. of trash in, in less than two hours. Uh, the area that I cleaned up, um, the, the winners were uh, White Claw and Yingling. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, cans, bottles, fast food wrappers, mattresses, tires, furniture, carpet, you name it. Um, we had a huge pile at the end. Um, more people are getting involved. Um, the weather's warming up, not as fast as we like, but um, I told Bruce and, and Mark today we need to take advantage of the next six or seven months of warm weather and try and get some people out and, and work on getting these roads cleaned up. Um, Public Works is coming around picking up what we collect on Monday so that we don't have to take it to the landfill. And again, shout out to the Mikkel and her family had the pleasure of working with them on, on Saturday. That, that was fun. Um, uh, Shadow Hills, too, too many red flags to list. I, I'm not gonna go over everything that's already said from the MOU, lack of transparency, lack of inclusion in the discussion. Um, it's just got red flags everywhere. Um, and I hate to disagree with you, but the property is secure. We just heard that the sheriff's department couldn't get in there on Easter Sunday. He might not know a way to right? get in there. Hey, I don't want to be. They, they were called out there. <laughs> <laughs> the sheriff's department was called out there twice over the weekend. By the way, mm -hmm. so, and this property was known maybe to a few hundred people prior to all this, and thanks to the media and social media, now it. Thousands of people are aware of this property, so, you know, let your imagination figure that one out. Um, I think that's all I got. Thank you. I would say just for the record, we did respond out there to the questions for uh, We did. Uh, Michael, you would want to use, front. you'd want to use that podium. Tom. We did have an opportunity, uh, Sheriff Mike Lewis, we did have an opportunity to confront uh, two of the lawless thugs on these ATVs. And... Um, <laughs> They fled on us. Uh, we did catch one up in Sharptown at the gas pump, and we seized his ATV and we took it from him. We towed it and we charged him accordingly. Good job. Well, and and that apprehension was made by Deputy Nick Acree. And if you know Nick Acree, he's a monster. You're not going to get away from him. <laughs> and he managed to grab the kid while he was at the gas pump while he was gassing up his ATV. But we snatched it. We had it towed, and, and he was charged accordingly. Um, I can tell you, I um, while I'm up here, I was never asked to support this event because I don't support the event. I don't. I've never. I've, I don't. Um, I, and I was never asked my opinion about having this event. I'm saying this because I've been told that in comments made to this group that I supported this event. Yes. Yes. Is, is that true? Yes. yes. Well, let me make one thing perfectly clear. Wow. I have never been involved in any discussion ever other than being told it was going to happen and we'll keep you posted. That's all she does. My, my opinion was never sought. I don't support it, but I promise you this. There will be deputies, additional deputies, that are going to be paid to work that day in Shadow Hills to protect your development. You. I promise you that. I promise you that. They will be in Shadow Hills to protect your development. Um, I will promise you that. Do, do. But um, I was here for the last public comments. I'm here for these public comments. And quite frankly, I hurt for you guys because I want one in my backyard. And when I saw my resources being sent out there this weekend, I was frustrated for each of you sitting in this room. Because I can only imagine on Resurrection Day, on Easter, having to deal with all that noise in your backyard. And, and having to deal with all the comments being made by this group on social media. And I apologize for that. But we will protect you. We will be in your neighborhood on those dates. And uh, 
will hold those accountable. That's all I can do. Um, the, two big, the two subjects tonight, I guess, um, the Shadow Hills and then the tax credit, I um, understand uh, how the fire service is upset about having to pay um, taxes on the um, $1,500. And I don't see why we can't get a ruling from the IRS through our finance, and maybe there should be a letter sent to our finance director um, asking, I'm sure the IRS ans answers those kind of questions all the time, not necessarily about the fire service, but questions about what people have to pay taxes on. So I think that's uh, what we need to do. We need to ask the, um, we can't tell them to do that. We can only ask that they would um, um, send a letter to the IRS and get a ruling. And we'll have to live by that. And unfortunately, if, it, if it's the way that we've been told, unfortunately, that's the way it's going to have to be. Shadow Hills, um, you know, we've all had our say about it. <laughs> I talked to our council attorney today, and I talked to Laura and Mr. Cannon, and um, I think that, unfortunately, government a lot of times is has to, reacts to things that isn't right. And that's when, if you look at Annapolis and all the laws that gets passed up there, the legislation, it's done after something has happened, not to prevent something. So hopefully, uh, Mr. Cannon, I know um, Mr. Baker mentioned it, we can either have a work session or we can talk to our, our legal and um, come up with some kind of solution, whether we can um, do something to prevent this from happening or something to keep it from happening in the future. Um, I would support that, so we'll see what goes. Thank you. Any of the comments? I hope everyone had a, a great Easter. I mean, we can't forget about that, Resurrection Sunday. Um, solar eclipse is coming. It's a pretty big deal. I hope everyone's got their glasses. Um, <laughs> I think that's a great idea, Joe, to look into the uh, what our finance can do for the 1099. And uh, it's just uh, it's just something we need to work on. So I'll let you I'll let you have it. Sure. Under presidential comments, uh, I'd also like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, I'm always uh, surprised as to how well everybody can have. Uh, well, everybody speaks. It's not an easy thing to get up in public and to speak, and a very articulate group we have here. Uh, Fiona, that includes you. Very well done. Um, Councilman Baker and Holloway, yeah, we, we will get this on the agenda to see what the council needs to do in order to, to tighten up um, uh, the restrictions on um, uh, the use of property in Wicomico County. I think that's important that we look into that. And as Joe said, things happen, and all of a sudden you realize maybe uh, where adjustments have to be made, and this is obviously where an adjustment has to be made. Um, I had one curious issue where um, when uh, Councilman Merritt mentioned the White Claw, I wasn't sure whether it was Sheriff Lewis or Madam State's attorney that maybe had thrown that can out there because <laughs> you were both pointing fingers at each other. I answered that was the route she took home. <laughs> uh, for the, it was the route she took home. Thank you, Sheriff. We, we didn't <coughs> want to make sure we had that on the record. But uh, Outside of that, Jeff, I couldn't agree more with, um, with Lee Alton as an employee of Wicomico County. Uh, he was a leader. Uh, he's also worked on the council of the city of Fruiton, city Fruiton, as you know. And uh, I will never forget the day we had one of our 10-year storms right after the year before we had the t another 10-year storm. And I was driving down Pemberton Drive, and I, I thought I saw someone in the ditch. So I thought, well, maybe I better try to turn around. Well, it was Lee, and he was actually working in the ditch. He was, he hadn't fought, he was working in the ditch. Uh, and that's the kind of person he was. Uh, he not only was a leader with, with, his, with his people, but he also got out and literally in, in the trenches and did the work and uh, has always been an excellent guy to work with. We're going to miss him a lot. Uh, as a point of clarification, this will be all I'll say. Two things. One is we will uh, talk to the um, uh, legislative assistant for uh, uh, Ben Cardin and see if we can't get her to get, get us some very specific issues in regard to the fire department's uh, tax issues. Um, they're, they're usually very helpful with that type of thing. 
in regard to a couple points made here earlier, um, I did check. Um, there was the, the fiscal year uh, 24 through 28 CIP. Uh, the Connolly Mill project was in there. It was scheduled for about $100,000. That was actually uh, scheduled to be um, expended in 2027. So that was the 24 CIP. It was monies that were going to come out of what they call PEGA, sort of the operating budget. <coughs> Um, as of this year, as you know, it was dropped completely. So it wasn't in there for any years whatsoever. So that being the case, when I attended the, um, the Tri-County Council meeting and we were finalizing the documents for what they call the SEDS documents, it's a comprehensive economic development strategy document. Uh, that's a long-term plan for the Tri-County area. Uh, I did inform them. I said, well, I need you to know you have it listed but you, you're, you're gonna to wanna to take it off because I don't see it right now being planned for the next five years. So that's why it's been removed from the SEDS document, but we can certainly add it in next year with just the stroke of a pen. I just wanted to make you aware of that clarification. So that being said, um, I have to adjourn, right? Entertain a motion to adjourn from legislative session to go into open work sessions followed by two closed work sessions pursuant to the general provisions article section 3-305 B3 for the state's attorney and department of public works to consider the acquisition of real property for a purpose, public purpose and matters directly related thereto to protect the county's bargaining power. Motion. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor. Aye. 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 Legislative meeting is adjourned. We're reconvening as Wicomico County Council in legislative session 2024-07 for April 2nd, 2024. The first item we have on the open work session is uh, proposed changes to the Wicomico County Personnel Manual, Chapter 24, titled work Workers' Compensation. Uh, Mrs. Don O'Hare, Human Resources Director, is here, as well as uh, Sheriff Mike Lewis. <laughs> Hopefully my okay. partner in crime is coming. Okay. Non-crime. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Donna O'Hara, Director of Human Resources for Wyacomico County. And hopefully uh, Sheriff Lewis is going to be joining me for this particular part. Um, just as an introduction, um, we have had multiple uh, requests from employees who are out on workers comp due to injuries sustained on the job to try to help them work through uh, their time out for more extensive injuries. Typically, it, it, this is not the case, but there have been a couple of circumstances, especially within the corrections and law enforcement departments, <clears throat> where their injuries are more severe and it takes a longer time for them to heal. And um, we are just coming on their behalf to speak on their behalf to ask for what we currently do is um, for the first 30 days, we continue their pay as is, and then we reduce by however much the workers' comp check is, we reduce that amount so we can continue to take their health insurance, their pension, and all those, those types of things out for them while they heal. Um, <clears throat> again, most of the time by three months, these individuals are back to work. Um, so we pick the, uh, a 90 day to extend it to from the 30 to try to help them a little bit longer. I did provide some data on <clears throat> what a typical person's, what, what one of these individuals, uh, I've made a, a, some similar numbers, but obviously um, not to identif identify a, per a particular individual. Um, as far as what it would look like, and uh, I, I don't, I didn't see this in the brief book, but I can certainly provide a copy of what what it looks like after a 14-week period of time for someone like that. If we're not taking those deductions out um, throughout that time period, what it looks like for them when they come back to work and have to owe money back on some of those deductions. But I would like to thank uh, Sheriff Lewis for joining me tonight and taking time out of his busy schedule to help me present this and to just share any thoughts he has as someone who is in the department that is severely affected by this sometimes when we have a longer term injury. So. Uh, good evening. 
Good evening. Good evening. Uh, sheriff Mike Lewis on behalf of the Wicomico County Sheriff's Office. Let me say this. I've been sheriff in this county now going on 18 years, and um, this is a document that is well overdue. Um, our HR director, Ms. Donna O'Hare, you have done a masterful job assembling this, and I've met with my command staff, and we all agree this streamlines everything, not only for our employees, but for the administrators and, and the command staff who have to deal with these issues every single day. And everything you've done here, you've just done a wonderful job, and I wanted to say thank you. Thank you. You've done a great job with this. Thank you very much. I fully support this. We've been needing this for a long time. It is a much-needed revision, and it's comprehensive. It covers everything. I've looked at the summary that was presented to me a couple weeks ago and the document itself, and masterful job, job well done, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. so much, and Thank I mean you. that. Great job. Thanks, Sheriff. Any uh, comments, questions from council? Uh, looking at some of the other counties, it looks like we're kind of behind the curve. We are a little bit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially with um, law enforcement and corrections who are at much higher risk just because of the nature of their job that they get injured more often, not to their own negligence or anything right. else. It's just the nature of the job. <laughs> this is for all the departments, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It is. Okay. But it really addresses the needs that, that we have needed for a long time within the Wycombe County Sheriff's Office. And I just thank her so much for this because this is this is overdue and it's much needed. So thank you again. Sure. And then roads, um, solid waste, those are also high risk uh, departments, not because of anything that anybody does wrong, but just the nature of the job, heavy equipment, um, land shifting and things like that. You just really never know what's going to happen and how long the recovery is going to be. So. Yeah, I think I would say I, I would. Uh echo what the sheriff said too i think it's been well done very well prepared i know that uh, vice president Merritt and i sat with uh, mrs hurley during our agenda meeting and, and mrs hurley is very knowledgeable in a lot of personnel matters in my comico county with a lot of history and knowledge and uh, we went through it for for about i'd say about about 20 minutes and um I, I think it is as you said sheriff i think it's very much needed for a long time and i'm i'm, I'm glad to see we're taking that initiative thank you mr president uh, yeah, appreciate good. it <laughs> this council as a whole um okay with moving forward as is mm -hmm. okay we're good okay. sheriff thank you again. thank you sir thank you all very much thank you yes, sir mm -hmm. so our next step would be to present a resolution to you for that yeah, it's going to require a public hearing okay. um, but it only requires one week of advertising so okay. we can have that the next meeting okay april the 16th okay great thank you, right. thank you. great work <laughs> next item we have on the agenda uh, administrative uh, leave for county employees serving as election judges. Yes, and Ms. I'm going to let Church. her steal the show on this one. <laughs> Just state your name as Church for the public. Thank Good you. evening. My name is Dion Church, election director for Wicomico Board of Elections. Yeah, glad to have you here. Thank you. So um, I was recently talking with the county executive and Bunky um, in regards to the election law for election judges for the state of Maryland for um, people that serve as election judges. Currently under election law 10202, um, state employees receive one hour of administrative leave for each hour served as an election judge up to a total of eight hours. So I wanted to come before you all today to see if if you will honor that for our county employees. One of the reasons why they do it for state employees is of course to encourage people to be judges. Um, and just because the importance of serving that day um, is good and just giving back their time. Um, and currently there is a bill and I think um, AK told you that in her letter at the General Assembly HB 700 of uh, where they're trying to pass it statewide for each county where um, not only the state employees would get reimbursed but county employees would also so my goal is to get ahead of that if the bill is passed it won't go in effect until actually june the first okay so i'm just asking that you all would consider doing that even if the bill doesn't pass i just think it's a nice thing to do for county employees and it will also encourage other employees to participate in um serving as an election judge okay any questions yes mr church have you had have you had um reluctance amongst people to volunteer to be election judges how's how does that we don't have as much of a problem here on the shore. The problem is really on the western shore. 
Our major issue is just making sure that we have bipartisan teams and putting people in the right places. So we get the judges. It's a matter of being able to diversify and make sure that everything is bipartisan. So sometimes we don't always have the balance of numbers that we want. That's what makes the job hard here on the shore. So we'll in this situation, will you strive toward being bipartisan, even with county employees? Definitely. Yes. Now, I mentioned this to Anthony when he was there. Have you ever considered cutting the judge judge's hours back to a half a day if they wanted it that way? The, the complaints I've heard from people that have been judges, that's their biggest complaint. The day is so long. What is it, from like 6 o'clock in the morning to 9 at night? It is a very long day for yeah. our judges. Um, Some we, of them might want to do that long of a day, but you might have better luck getting judges if you split the day. We do have um, some people that don't work all day. We hire them through an outside agency to do different jobs. But our actual judges, we just have not been able to hire enough people to be able to do the split shifts. We tried it in some areas like our greeters or where you find people that are greeting um, our citizens as they come in. Um, our greeters do split shifts, and people that help with the equipment do split shifts. So we've tried a number of different things, and people seem to be happy with it. It's just hiring enough people to cover those spots. Currently, we have about 375 people that we hire just to do the election. So it's just a matter of us getting enough people to be able to do that. But it is a great idea. I think so too, Jim. Yes. I think it's a very good idea. Yeah. Yes. And promote it, you know, like, you know, work what you want, six or eight, however it has to be, or 10, yeah. And I'll tell you, um, we are doing um, something different this year. We're doing something called election. I know we're getting a little off topic, but just to kind of let you know, uh, we're doing a program called Election Page Program, or where we're letting students come in to earn service hours, and they're working four hours. We're also trying a program with 16-year-olds this year. So we are trying to get a lot of diversity in there to help with that. And we may go back to Pollington, maybe one or two polling places just to try that. So that's something that I'll look into doing, and I'll let you know what happens. Yes, yeah. okay, moving forward. Yes. Yeah, yes, I, just, right I got a mm -hmm. quick sure. question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, jury, I don't know which one of you can answer this. Is the county employees paid for jury duty? When, aren't they paid administrative leave? Uh, they, they, uh, they are, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, outside of the fact that one's a volunteer position and one's, right. one's uh, not. Oh, I apologize. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Okay. Didn't have the manual open them. So, so they're not, they're not for jury duty. They take yeah twenty five dollars a day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not sure what because payroll is now not with HR anymore. So oh. <laughs> I haven't sorry. had that opportunity. That's I, okay. I know they're paid the thirty dollars. <laughs> right. right. Um, Hi, Sandra Wallace, disbursement manager. Um, for jury duty, they are not. So what happens is they're paid their normal uh, everyday wage. So okay. for the amount of hours that they're gone. So if they leave, you know, say at 8 a.m., they have to report. They come back at 2. They must mandatory. They, they must report back to work to finish out their shift. But no, and then they get to te to uh, keep their jury duty pays as well, whatever okay. they receive. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. That's everybody okay. With but they don't have. To, I just want to make sure I was clear. They don't have to use leave. No, no. they do not so lose leave. Paid. No, they get paid their normal their normal day. So it's as yeah. if they work that day, but we code it under a different code. Okay, okay. I thought so. Yeah. I wasn't completely. <laughs> it's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I was like I think we they, they, we still pay them through the day. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? No. Um, where would we? Uh, how would we go about this? Um, it would just be a resolution that would be put forward by legal, um, and then you would approve it. Yeah. yeah, because our judges, you know, do get paid. So I think Laura and I were talking, and it's something similar to what you do with blood uh, It would be like blood donation. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it would come back as a resolution and a public hearing as well, and we can do that at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lee. Okay, thank you. So we'd have thank you. Like write it up. Yeah. 
You're going to be sick of seeing me because I'm not going to see you. Next item on the agenda is the proposed additional <laughs> holiday schedule for 2024. This is follow-up to when the um, county executive had proposed uh, both July 5th and December 24th, and the council had asked me to check to see what was going on in other counties, and I provided a spreadsheet of all the other counties that I was able to get information from. Um, I apologize, very small font. Um, but basically, in almost every area, we are kind of behind in, in as far as leave time. I did a, a, a separate little um, analysis of of just our um, personal days and our annual leave, and um, we're we're at the bottom on that as well. So I think maybe it was a maybe a way to give a little bit back, um, and it wouldn't be anything that would be in the personnel manual that it's always going to be Christmas Eve. I think the intent, and I don't want to speak on the county executive's behalf, but uh, I think the intent was just um, to take it year by year and to come in front of council and ask each time. Um, there was a discussion about floating holidays, and I did talk about uh, talk to the, the other counties about that, and that seemed to be a bad idea. It seemed like it was abandoned in almost every county, and instead what they did was give a couple of extra personal days. Instead, um, it seemed like logistically the floating holidays just was a nightmare for them to keep track of and try to logistically deal with, so. Any questions, comments? So it sounds like the pers personal leave is, is, is the is the way to go or well this i think this is basically addressing the fact that the county executive s still was asking for uh, christmas eve of this year only to have off so i'm just here just christmas for, eve yes not not, 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 yeah. not july 5th i think she abandoned that one so um Shane, I, or I, jeff go ahead so my thought is uh, get close to that mic if you don't mind. <laughs> my thought is to do two personal days i mean i yeah. i hate to see yeah. her abandon the the one idea, I didn't like the idea. I didn't think it should be that date. I think give them two extra personal days that they can use whenever they want to use them. And put that in the personal manual is instead of two personal days, have four personal days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, that's just my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I, I don't know why we're thinking about shutting the government down. We're here to serve the people of the county. And, and I understand it's Christmas Eve. If an employee wants to take off, then they just schedule it off. Um, it shouldn't be that big a deal, but I don't think we should shut the government down uh, outside of the holidays that we already have. I'd, I'd be in favor of the two personal days. And uh, looking at this, thank you for this uh, spreadsheet sure. um, because it looks like we're a little light on sick days too. Our, our accruals are behind as well. So as we move through the personnel manual uh, further down the road, um, we, we can talk about that then, but we are behind on our accruals. I don't know when the last time our accrual rate was updated, but we are pretty low. Yeah, definitely two personal days. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Josh. Um, just the, I guess I'm looking at what was provided to council in the page. Um, I don't know if you have that, I guess the, the two charts. Um, so I'm just trying to understand: is the the two days for the personal leaves? Is that what we? Is that what we only have two right now? Mm -hmm. Just two. Yeah, and we, the only other count, uh, entity that only has two is the city of Salisbury. But there are accruals in other areas. Plus, they work from 8:30 to 4:30 and get paid for full days and things like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and, the, and I guess the only I mean I've said this before. Just the other comments. I think most other jurisdictions, most other nonprofits, for profits, everyone's kind of moving away from the Flood. picking a religious holiday to make that the day that someone has to take off. Right. Um, correct. You know, the more that we can have something that's, you know, assuming you don't celebrate Christmas or whatever, you know. Um, so, yeah, the more that we can move in that direction, the better. So I personally, I feel the same way if we can do just a, a general day. Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be a floating holiday or whatever you want to call it, but a personal day or something like that, I think makes the most sense. Okay. Um, well, I, I agree with the two personal days, but the only problem with that is next year they'll forget about that and come back and want the holidays off too. But for now, I guess we can go with the two personal days. I've learned that okay you can't make that. everybody happy all the time in the last year. <laughs> so Pardon me, I didn't you just, know what you said. I said I've learned that you can't make everybody happy all the time. You I just know, do the best you I can. Know, I, know, yeah, I, know. So I think the general consensus is that uh, – we're, we do not want to see the December 24th listed as another holiday. 
uh, stay with the schedule that we have, but we would like you to consider adding two more personal days. Understood. Okay. Correct. Correct. Okay. Right. Okay. Yes. Is 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 two like average among no, all? No, actually, or four average among all the counties. Actually, um, it's more like five or six. Okay. For the counties that border our county, mm -hmm. yeah, what they get six. Oh mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Okay. Start with so if we start with four, we'll start with, we'll start with four counties. We'll start with four this year, and then year. Joe, when they come, we can make it six. And then this next year, year we <laughs> then I got to rewrite that chapter. <laughs> Just change for the number. All right. I'll but leave it. But you also too have to look at when you're thinking about this stuff. Look at the total package right. of yeah, other you're benefits. Right. That you're right. The, this county may offer yeah. that True. other counties do not. And that's why I tried to make sure that I encompassed all the time off as best I could. Um, and, and you're correct. We have a great pension plan. We have, we have a great the 457B with a matching. With a 20 percent match. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's that's unheard of. That's right. pretty good. So somewhere in the middle of the the, the highest and and the lowest, you know, is probably. Four. Somewhere to shoot for, you know. Okay. We're getting 100 percent more, so right. Two more days. Yeah, and, and, and last comment. I just think the more that we can move away from also those zero to five, you know, zero to five years of service, you know, was this it says ten days or twelve days for, you know, and then that's yeah. a crew. Well, that's well, yeah. that's an annual leave, so that would keep yeah a keep annual growing. leave in general. That's really right. what I mean. The, from what I understood, the the There's you know. Um, millennial generation and younger now is just tend to from all the trends that i've seen uh, they want more time off that's yeah. people <laughs> <laughs> they really yeah they yeah. care more about the time off than the salary the ability so Start um and it looks a bit uh you know and, the, and then the less the, le the less complicated we can make it um and it's also on that note you really want to have a high amount because you want to be able to get the right people in the door right. if someone said if we can't hire someone because it's their first year and they're like they look down and they say oh you're only getting 10 days of a crew yeah. leave or whatever like i don't want to go work there right and so, especially if they're leaving a place where they've had three or four weeks yeah and so, you really want a good employee yeah <laughs> so yeah the, really the update there that really kind of concerns me and just that uh, that o to five part i want us to be a place where people want to come work and not i don't want to give anyone a single reason to be able to say oh i don't want to go work there great yeah. <laughs> usually it's because they're glad to have a job <laughs> That's, that's, that's old school, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. School. yeah. Wait till a recession to that. That's, that's a little bit of a different world these days. <laughs> yeah. All right, we we have a consensus there. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the personnel man manual chapters one through three. This is a bit of a load, but I think we can move quickly enough with it. Um, we'll let you take the lead on this. Okay. Um, as you all know, the, uh, the original manual I think was written in two thousand three. And um, really the only updates that cause it to be the August 2010 were any legislative bills and resolutions from what I've been able to gather from the different um, versions that I was able to find and work with. Um, so really over these decades that have come to pass, uh, any updates in laws and just our policies and our procedures that have just moved forward have not been updated in the manual. And the longer we go without having those things up, uh, updated, the higher our risk of some type of repercussions as far as lawsuits and things like that. So, um, and a lot of things in the whole manual were spoke of at, in three or four different chapters. And so if you weren't known, didn't know to flip back and forth, you as an employee, you may have a piece of information about a particular policy, but not the whole picture. And you may not be compliant in the policy and not have any idea because everything was kind of all over the place. So my goal um, was to get all of the information on each different part of working for the county and the same chapter in the same vicinity so that when somebody reads it, they actually have a full picture of what that policy is. So with that said, um, we uh, this is a rough draft and I'm, my, I'm all ears for <laughs> anything that you've read or have any suggestions on. Um, the best thing I found was for me to go ahead and just do a summary of each chapter that I revised because if I had given you a red line draft, your head would have exploded and it would have been like a 500, 600, 700 page document. <laughs> uh, and I think so. the, council, the council has had the opportunity to review the summary. We appreciate okay. that. It's been, okay. It is in the brief book. Okay. Any questions in regard to um, some of the items? I, I would ask, first of all, is um, are we considering like an employee portal? I know we've done that before where, where the employees can actually sign on and 
ask a question or, or, or at least share their opinion? It's something we've done before. You may want to check uh, maybe with IT. Or so we did talk to, uh, actually, a uh, meeting with uh, the internal auditor uh, for, for our HR thing. And actually, we are going to um, talk to IT about having a place where they can send it directly to us, for whether it's a complaint or just a question. The portal does, um, the uh, employee uh, self-service does have a drop-down menu that has the entire manual. It has a lot of their, most of the forms that they need. It has copies of all of their their um, health insurance policies, disability policies, and everything there. And uh, my new, my, I have a fairly fresh new team um, that is really doing a really good job of educating the employees when we do orientation now. We've revamped the orientation and trying to really make sure that we do a good job with that, so. Okay, all right. Um, another question I had, uh, and I'm trying, I'll just try to go through it in chronological order under, sure. under the state's attorney's office uh -huh. in chapter one, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned leave accrual. Um, and I was wondering whether or not does it, it, uh, leave accrual, uh, for attorneys, does that include vacation, sick and personal time? So I'm going uh, <laughs> to, um, the, for the state's attorney's office, um, they, she may just be outside. She, She's right there. Help. 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 I'll be honest with you. I took exactly what um, was there before that was agreed upon. And If you don't have the has, answer, you can certainly give it to us later, okay? Because we're putting yeah, you on the spot. The question was whether or not leave accrual for attorneys included vacation, sick, and personal time. So it doesn't, it, to the best of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. it, Attorneys have always been treated differently because they're at will, um, but I will. I prefer to look at this and kind yeah, of. Yeah, just got that one for you. Yeah. <laughs> Come on down, Sam. <laughs> That's twice. Twice. <laughs> Stay up there. That's why they're here. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I can't do it truth? by myself. Yeah. As far as accruals go for states attorney, uh, states attorneys themselves, they do not earn anything. Mm. What we do is we do have a memorandum in there somewhere that states after so many years, they get 40 hours of vacation. So they get paid out that 40 hours of vacation. They do not use that 40 hours of vacation. And I want to say it's four years of service. And then it increases again, I think, at eight years of service, I think. But I'd have to go look that up. I have, I have it, of course, at the office, but I don't yeah. have it handy um, on my phone to access. Uh, yes. Uh, but, and they're all working more than 40 hours a week. They're, most of them are working more than 60 hours a week, and most of them don't take vacation. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's... Yeah, it's a, it's a tough job. It's a it's mm -hmm. a tough job that um, they have. But we, it's it, as I understand it, the history lends to it's just what we've never done because they're at will and afforded some flexibility that way. All right. I, I have a question. When you say that you, they work sixty hours a week, is that they don't get paid their their salary? Their salary, they don't they get, get comp time at all. They are technically the only salaried employees the county has, other than your elected officials. You don't get a comp time and you work no, on 60 hours? No. Was that against the fair labor laws that you worked them 60 hours? I don't believe so, no. Could you check that out for me? We can. Please, thank you. Of course. Okay, thank you very much. Of course. Thank you. The, um, in section um, 110, departmental standard operating procedures. Sure. Thank you. You're talking about the relationship between uh, administration and the department heads. Um, I'm wondering whether or not there shouldn't be something included there as well, referencing uh, the county council. Okay. Uh, and, and the internal order as well. Okay. Um, and we can give it to you in written form at some sure. point in time. Um, but something to the effect that the county council. Um, Maybe should, maybe would approve the standard operating procedures for the legislative branch and the internal auditor. Okay. All right. Gosh. It just uh, the only thing that was that I wanted to bring up was I know in the past we've had some back and forth on the personnel manual versus the contract, and I know on here the I'm not sure what page that is. 
right before chapter one, the language that we have in here, that one the, the disclaimer about the personal manual supersedes any replace and replaces any prior version of the county personnel manual, et cetera, et cetera. The personnel manual does not constitute a contract, nor is it a promise of continued employment. I guess along those lines, are we, do we feel like we've updated it enough that we are clear going forward as far as the what supersedes what or what does not, what's more important, um, so that we don't end up any legal issues again? That's a very standard lead-in paragraph right. for personnel manuals. <clears throat> And then, and as you go through, as we go through this process, um, where whether it's corrections or the sheriff's department, because they do operate under their own standard operating procedures that are very specific to them, it will refer to that superseding, and also the CBA that supersedes um, this manual and whatever uh, method it has to, whatever the topic uh, is being referred to. So. Those things are mentioned throughout as they need to be for those particular entities. So, okay. yeah, I trust you all just as long as that sure. part's clear. I know that right. that's been an issue for the last that we've run right. into. Right. And but when it's all said and done, it'll still go through the whole legal process with everybody. So, the, um, everybody, uh, we have law looking at it to make sure we are 100% clad before we. Yeah. <laughs> we also have in uh, section 203 under director administration referencing the. Uh, responsibilities of the director of administration you might want to be more specific with that and they say, and say that the director of administration has that responsibility within the executive branch okay okay and under 204 I have, I have a few things I'm going to try to get through them as quick as I can okay. under 204 where the director of human resources uh, it's referencing, referencing that the Director of Human Resources shall have the responsibility and authority for the overall administration for the personnel system and delegated by the county executive. I think that as you get down further in referencing um, such responsibility and authority, um, you should also say that the um, personnel system as adopted by the county council and shall have and shall review personnel actions. In, in 204 in yeah. that area, okay. Right. And like I said, we can provide you, you know. If, if that I, would be great. If, if it's you important wanna... to review it with you first to see if it, how, how it works with you, how it plays sure. out with you. But then we can, uh, we can put greater clarification for you later. By all means, email me, send me um, any of that that you'd like, and I'll take notes as best I can. But I might reach out just to clarify. So. Sure. sure. <laughs> and again, I think it's, it would be similar also that um, when you're talking about um, uh, in section 304 um there should be i think uh some note some notice again where uh when you're talking about the um the director of human resources shall recommend such amendments to the director of administration for approval i would say of classifications within the executive branch okay and if the if approved the executive branch uh, will then submit it just trying to help i think part of what you had suggested you wanted to differentiate was the distinction between the two branches. Sure, because it, it just helps <laughs> right. all the way around, sure. <laughs> definitely. Um, it's a similar situation. I'm not going to get into it. a similar situation in 306 that I, that I, that's there. Okay. Um, and more things as far as uh, to approve positions within the executive branch. Again, we see the same uh, repetition in uh, Section 307 okay. under 2I. Um, what else could there be? Again, uh, and again, I, the distinction should be made in section 308 under section D. Got it. In 309, you have classification approval, mm -hmm. where the director of administration shall approve or disapprove all changes to and requests for reclassification of positions. I think we uh, there needs to be a clarification there uh, that that would only be for the executive branch. That doesn't need to be in the document, but for, for reference, that should be the only uh, oversight. I think it should probably stay here that the um, the director of administration shall approve or disapprove all changes and requests uh, for reclassification of positions within the executive branch prior to the submission to the county council for final approval.
Kafka. Maybe this is a question for you, Mr. Wilbur, on 310 under acting capacity. I'm wondering whether there should be a provision about an employee serving as acting director and deputy director so that it's consistent with charter section 414. Yep, can be. Okay. Director and deputy director. Yes. Okay. Um, hang on a second here. Well, we're only doing one through three, so I can't go on all night. <laughs> well, I originally did six, but probably three in a time is probably yeah, a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> under, um, i got to get back up to the number, uh, 310, acting capacity, again, similar. Under, um, trying to fit it all in here. 3F, I think it is, or under, excuse me, under section F. 310 section F starts out with all appointments to acting capacity mm -hmm. for positions. Um, in charter section 315A, you know, the initial, there's a reference to the initial appointment of a deputy director that it requires council approval. Um, the, the charter actually is silent on appointing an acting deputy director. Um, so we're wondering whether the, the whether the sentence should be a sentence should be added to this section uh, that appointments to acting deputy director must be confirmed by the county council. <laughs> That's part of what we're probably going to request. Okay. And since F is the last part of the alphabet in <laughs> in section three, that would mean I'm done. <laughs> you don't want to keep going to four? Yeah. We are on a roll, I know. <laughs> I only brought <laughs> one through three with me. Oh. <laughs> but I can certainly run downstairs. <laughs> so um, that's everything. Any okay. Anything from anyone else? In, no, no. I agree with right. F, yeah. And as we move forward, um, how does the council want to do this? Do Do you want me to us to go through each section three at a time as it works out until we get to the end? And then at, at the very, very end, everything we've discussed, present the whole thing for final. Yeah, I think end. so, because I think we'll have vetted it so carefully that at that point in time, okay. it's not going to be as if it's going to take us a half an hour okay. to go through the whole document. Okay, understood. That'd be great. That works. Yes, indeed. So we'll be doing this for the rest of the year. I'll see you all every time. <laughs> and we honestly, I think we could do more than three, but just for starters. Well, some of them, some of them, you'll have one chapter where you'll that's all you'll want for that day, and then some you'll be able to knock out. Really. Yeah, I don't know how you do it. I tell you, it's not, I, not I, my wheelhouse. I told Miss Hurley that I'm going to give it a birth certificate, a social security <laughs> number, and a birth date, and everything when it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on my insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. All right. Well, thank you again. Yeah, really great work. Thank you. Very, thank very you. good job. Thank good you, uh, Mr. Yeah. Wilbur. Thank you. I know it needs to be done, and uh, so uh, it, when I when you know you're you know you're doing something that needs to be done, it, it helps. Yeah. <laughs> so thank, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Appreciate it. Next item on the agenda is the cannabis social equity fund. Uh, Mr. Andrew Illuminati. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How are you, Mr. Bozeman? Are you going to come up? Mr. Bozeman, are you going to come up or are you going to stay with her? If you have any questions towards the end, he's available, okay. but okay. once we get the PowerPoint going, all right, I'll try to move quickly. Now, if you can just go to the... That looks right. It doesn't load. I have it on the phone. There, there we go. Okay. Oh All right, so this is the Community Reinvestment and Repair Fund. The cannabis, there's multiple ways in which money flows to the county in cannabis tax revenue. The Community Reinvestment and Repair Fund is one of them. 
it's a percentage of the adult use tax revenue. Uh, there was a formula that was used by the state to come up with a percentage of how much each county would receive. And it was based upon, as you see on the third slide, disproportionate enforcement of the cannabis prohibition before July 1st, 2022. So it was number of arrests and prosecutions. And when that plays out, there were 5,923 charges between July 1st, 2022 to January 1st, 2023 in Wicomico County, which was 2.34% of the state average. So that is how much of the funds from the state will come to Wicomico County. This is made up through the nine, the current 9% sales tax on cannabis, 5% to the cannabis public health fund, 35% of that 9% to the community reinvestment, 5% to the jurisdiction directly, 5% to the, the cannabis business assistance fund, and then 50% to the general fund. Each county is required to adopt a law establishing the purpose for which money received from the fund may be used and every two years and even numbered years provide a summation of how the money was spent in the previous two years. So the fund may only be used for funding community-based initiatives intended to benefit low-income communities, funding community-based initiatives that serve disproportionately impacted areas, and any related administrative expenses. Money may not be expended from the fund for law enforcement agencies or activities, and money expended from the fund is supplemental to and may not supplant funding that otherwise may be appropriated for pre-existing local government programs. So if every year the council gives $30,000 to the Boys and Girls Club, you can't say we're not gonna give the $30,000 this year because we're gonna use this money. Uh, The Office of Social Equity conducted a survey in 2023. Every county was targeted. Uh, the public and elected officials could respond. And there was a study to sort of guide legislative bodies on how to move forward with awarding these funds. Now, these funds are different from that 5% that we talked about earlier that is just general revenue fund that can go to a number of things outside of this but this is specifically social equity funds. So here are the, re the results. There was an overwhelming percent that the public be able to participate in the awarding of the funds. Specifically, here's Wicomico County at the top. Of all the counties, Wicomico had over 80% say that the, there should be support for community involvement in the distribution and allocation of the funds. So. There was also a study on what should the counties focus on prioritizing. There were these topics. And when we look at Wicomico County, number one was education after school programs. Uh, tied for second was mental health, substance abuse services, housing and homeless prevention and youth engagement mentorship programs. And then all the way at the bottom is criminal justice reforms. And you can see through the highlighted that overwhelmingly education after school programs was of those who complete the survey, the desire. So then the Office of Social Equity released these four uh, thing, subject areas to consider when reviewing the various organizations that may receive funding, what are their current finances, what's their organizational structure, what strategy do they have, and then what are their programs. This then basically brings council to the decision of how will Wicomico County uh, allocate Office of Social Equity funds. So the OSE survey was that it should be community-based, that it should be citizen-based, and the position is that local management board is best equipped to do that. If council wants to have full control, then it would not be a citizen-based process council would advertise, evaluate, and approve every award. So the local management board is made up of the of multiple members uh, from various aspects of the community. One of the unique parts is that they're already advertising, awarding, 
and completing funding paperwork, completing all the grant requirements that are necessary to be uh, compatible with state requirements. This is something that they've been doing since their institution. Additionally, it includes parents, youth, private providers, representatives from advocacy groups, racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity, and local communities within the county. If there are any questions uh, for the local management board, Director Tim Bosman is here. Uh, they met last week. They are more than happy to take this on. They believe they are more than qualified and will be able to do this. Again, they will be reporting back to council because that ultimately biannual report will go to the uh, governor, Senate, and House. So these are the three actions for council. Uh, decide the awarding source. Is it going to be council or is it going to be local management board? <clears throat> Adopt a law. So based on that, then there will be a uh, first reading of a law establishing the process for which money received from the fund may be used. It's going to incorporate the mandate requirements that were discussed earlier, where funding for community-based initiatives is to be spent and that may not be used for law enforcement, may not be used to supplement current pre-existing uh, local government programs, and then enumerate the awarding source for the funds as well as require. Then the final thing will be because this is a even number year and specifically in the legislation, it says by December 1st, 2024, the report shall be made. This is uh, something that will be done in short order. The other benefit of using the local management board is that they're already enabled, they're already established, they've already been gone through council approval. It won't require advertising for a new citizen based board, writing the bylaws, writing the guidelines, bringing all that before you. There's already over a million dollars that the county has received from this that the county has not been able to spend because we haven't been able to create an awarding board. So the local management board does follow all the criteria that the state would would uh, reckon, would um, authorize. Yes, correct. And there's so there's really. I think well, that's a good fit. Do we have to change the job district descriptions or anything through the local management board? That um, we don't have job descriptions for them that I'm aware of. I think there's a section maybe that references their responsibilities, their duties. I thought it was, re thought it was included in the charter as one of the as one of the departments of the county. And that's what I'm talking about, the duties and responsibilities of the board. But I don't think there's like a specific job description. Make sure. Yeah, anybody. Um, I, I like that, that the local management board will be handling it. I think they're, they're the most in tune with, with the community. I don't think the police accountability board was ever going to be a good decision, though I know you're, everybody was looking for answers. Um, and I seriously think that the council has to have oversight on how the final spending is done. The council would have to make, would have to approve that. I mean, that's the purpose of having the, the, the seven member body here is that, you know, we have constituents to be concerned about as well. And um, I, I, I'm sure that the local management board can, can very easily do a great job with it. But when you're talking this kind of money, I think you cannot bypass uh, the elected officials in this county to have some type of oversight. It's a lot of money. So to help me draft the legislation, walk me through what council envisions the flow chart looking like so that the legislation can be written, drafted accordingly. Flow chart. Um, Mr. Bosman, would you have any input on that as far as how you recognize the fact of, of, of understanding ways to, to, to determine the needs in the community and how that might be something you would bring to us? And Because and, we don't want to get in the way and be obstructionists, but we certainly want to make sure that the final product has the blessing of, of the, the, the elected officials. Right. So. A lot of the topics that was discussed in the PowerPoint on that survey that uh, Mr. Illuminati showed you with uh, like youth homelessness, uh, mentoring, um, after school education, those are already needs that um, we've identified through the last community needs assessment that we did and um, talked about with you guys a few months ago. Mm -hmm. So they kind of parallel what we already know and that's what kind of we would be mainly looking for is like programs and services that, you know, we would be able to award, you know, this funding to. Could you put this together similar to what you did when you came here uh, about a month or two ago? It was, what was it, 600000 that you were, that, that was awarded the grant for recently for the computers, for the laptops? Yes. Yeah. Would this be a situation where you could take this thing and treat this funding in the same manner as if it were a grant 
and then bring that before the council with the item, itemized expenses or, yeah, so or we, awards? I think it's how we talked about it, too, is we already have the monitoring capabilities established. So when an award is made, like that grant, you know, we're already monitoring how it's spent. Um, our other programs where we award um, grants to other vendors in the county, nonprofits or whatever it be, we're constantly monitoring the performance to make sure they're hitting the mark, serving the number of people that they're supposed to be serving, and also spending the money appropriately per you know the grant award from the state. Do you also have a time period where you would um, announce that you know we are looking, we are you know we are looking for um, uh, recipients, something to that effect? Because I'm sure that the council, we don't want to create undue influence, but I'm sure that the council might say, you know, there's a really good organization here that I really think we should should look and look look at helping. So, I and we would want to be able to share that information with you, and, let, and so you could vet it. So I think whatever the dollar amount we're looking to use, I know there's a significant amount of money in there right now, but if we want to take a chunk of that, let's say, and put towards after school mentoring, then whatever that chunk of money is, we would have to follow the county procurement rules as well. So we would have to put it out for a proposal, you know, for different entities to respond to us, you know, how they envision using that money or whatever. And that's where the board comes in. They review the proposals and they, you know, decide what the best fit is, you know, for what we're trying to achieve. Was it so just want to make sure I understand what you're trying to say. So you don't have a problem with the board handling it. We just want to be able to approve those funds as, as needed. Is that what you're thinking? Yes. Okay, that's what I'm thinking too. Yeah. Since I, um, my church received grants from the local management board when it was originally formed, and what we have to do, um, it was an after-school program under the governor's crime prevention stuff. Um, we had to write a grant. I think that's the first procedure. We hear about it. You do a proposal. You write the grant. And some of it was like matching funds. I think some of the grants were matching funds. I don't know how it's done now. But um, we had to do timesheets for employees. We had visits from the person that was in charge. You still do that? Yep. We, um, we, had, we do site visits. You had to do honest. site. That's what it's called, site visits. Um, yeah. So it's really, um, you have to do what you said you're going to do in the grant. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why I support the local management board doing these fundings because you ha they really keep an eye on what you're supposed to be doing with the money, especially when children and families are involved because that's where you're supposed to be helping people like that. Right. So I do support them in managing this particular fund because I was I was part of that years ago and what will you do that will you be putting out some type of a request for grant for grant um I think yeah I, I guess once we establish however much money from this pot we want to put and I'll just use um after school mentoring as an example mm. however much we want to put that towards that then yeah we would advertise you know how we normally do um, and you would have so, to have some agency or organization come to you and say, okay, let, tell me where I sign or how, where I fill this out, right? Yep. So we would probably just use, I mean, it's pretty much mirrors what we already do now mm -hmm. as far as the guidelines from the state. So it would be a very similar template that we would use the mm -hmm. permit to put these out, you know, with all the other county um, requests for proposals. Would, just as a thought, would council entertain, like, if it's under... Twenty thousand dollars. It doesn't need to come to council for review because I could see some where an entity says we just need a few footballs, soccer balls, basketballs, and the expenditure is five hundred dollars, and we're putting that in the same category. Obviously, six hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money for computers, and that needs oversight. But I'm just trying to see in working with other counties and what seeing what the states are envisioning on how this could work. I could see that there are lower denomination requests that m just maybe pro forma, that they're in the best position to handle. It, it wouldn't be something that needs follow-up. It would be acquire the athletic equipment, distribute the athletic equipment, mm -hmm. and there's really no monitoring after that. Mm -hmm. So uh, just trying to get as much thought here as to how to draft the legislation. That's not a Feel? bad idea. I that's you know, I, I don't want to see this fund being used politically. And 
I don't know whether that would happen or not. Hopefully it wouldn't happen. But I, w I think it would be advantageous for the council to have more oversight. And, you know, these four or $500 grants could add up to $10,000 grants or $20,000 grants before it's over with. Because there's going to be a lot of hand excuse me, a lot of hands out there wanting this money, so. And I, and I think you could probably present it when you come before the council. It's not as if you have to come here for every $500 contribution. You would come here, I would see, with a collection, a total of maybe six or seven contributions at the same time, mm. where, you would, where, you would, where you would just package them all together. If it becomes onerous, then we can rework it, okay? I knew, it's uh, all new. I know when, uh, like, if you need to do work for the state or something, uh, 5,000 is the max before you have to go out to bid. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's maybe there's like a threshold. Maybe it is $500 be the threshold because, I mean, I could see, I could see a lot of people jumping in. And I, don't, I mean, we can, we can, we're going to try this out and we'll see if we need to make an adjustment. But I, my gut feeling is that we're going to have to put a, put a cap on, on, uh, on, on, <laughs> Let's just say a thousand dollars, and then anything above needs to come to council. I mean, I don't know. I can see that that happening or that threshold being raised. I think um, it's what you want to do with the money. Um, we had to pay staff, part-time staff. We had to provide transportation. You had to submit a budget, what it would cost, um, supplies you would need, just line item supplies for the children food, you know, snacks or whatever, you include it in your budget when you submitted your proposal. We received $30,000. After school program is not really cheap because you have to pay a staff person. People want to get paid. You don't get volunteers anymore. They want to get paid. So I think you need to consider all that and how much money you have available for after school program or crime prevention. And now I think the schools do that. But I'm, I'm, I'm a proponent of of, of letting it some things in the neighborhood. That's why our church got, you know, got the grant because we were in the neighborhood and we had two schools that we worked with. But it's, it's not $5,000. $5,000 really couldn't do anything, I don't think, unless it's a small project. But if you're trying to do an after-school program or some kind of crime prevention program, it's going to cost a little more. Mr. Bosman, you had a comment? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, an after-school program is going to cost and expensive, but I don't, I think that's something to consider with the legislation as well as like how time period you want these um, programs expended by. I think that'll be up to your discretion, Joe. Okay. I, I think, I think this is a new program. I think we should, you know, um, put the controls in and see how it goes. And, you know, if it shows to be burden, a burden managing it the way it is, I don't, I don't think managing money should ever be a burden, <laughs> really. <laughs> you know, I think that's what we're here here to do. So anyway. I, I agree with Joe. It's it's new. It needs oversight. I think the council should keep it. Folks, yeah, we're, we're gonna find out, Josh. Yeah, just to take it to the ten thousand foot level, just to, just to acknowledge. Obviously, the point of this program is to, to try to make transformational change, not transactional change, right? We wanna do something that's really going to get people uh, back on a, on a path to actually making real change. The, you know, the, the policies that we had uh, for, drug, for drugs in the 80s and 90s destroyed the American family. And a lot of this was because of cannabis, you know, or the, these kinds of uh, marijuana laws. And so you've lost folks for you know, the, the father or usually wasn't absent for, was absent for many years and that really destroyed things. So we're trying to get at, back at remediating that problem. We can't do anything. What we, we screwed over a lot of American families for, for 25 years with really bad zero tolerance policies. So this is a way to say, okay, now that it is legal, how are we uh, fixing that? So I guess I'll, you know, I'll lean in. I, I think the, um, you know, I think, uh, Having you all would be great, uh, local management board uh, to to, um, uh, to lead on that would be great. But I don't. I think we should be constantly thinking in terms of transformational, not transactional. I don't want to just throw out, okay, here's a couple baseballs and a soccer ball. Good luck. I hope your life gets better. You know, like I want to be able to say, 
hey, this program for financial literacy or this thing that is going to put you on the understanding of home ownership and, and you know, something like that. So um, I say all that, uh, uh, how we organize it, I, I think, and also I do, th I do agree with um, the fellow councilman. I think we do want to have a little bit of more. It's a new program. It's, it's a decent amount of money. I do want to make sure that we have our hands in it, and there's, there's seven of us that... Um, that respond to different communities. I want to make sure that we're responsive there, but I'd love to see it at the local management board, and I want to see it be transformational. To answer your question, Andrew, I think what maybe we would want to do is to fashion some type of a bill or a resolution that would establish guidelines and timelines as well. Uh, maybe every six months, every six months, the uh, local management board would put out a request, and they would have, let's say, a month or two months to finalize that request and then bring that before the council. Uh, I would defer to Mr. Bosman to tell us exactly what that time frame might be, understanding the fact that when you advertise for it, however you may do it, um, what the length of time might be to get the proper applicants in and to evaluate it and then get back to us. Would that be quarterly? Would that be semi-annually or what? Um, we try to do at the beginning of the fiscal year, like our, our grants now that we get through the um, community partnership agreement we put out at the beginning of the fiscal year or a little bit prior to, so we can start the fiscal year running on the ground with the programs. This kind of seems it's gonna work a little bit differently, but typically when we put uh, a request for a proposal out, it's usually somewhere near the neighborhood of 30 days people have to respond. Um, so could you could you work this out in a period of six months and come to the and, and we have it whereas every six months you will be um, putting out a notice or would you make it every quarter? I want, you have to have time to review. I think that's going to depend on how the money's flowing in and the amount of money that's flowing in. But that's more. These would be parameters that would. Yeah. They would be more of a shall. I mean, a may than a shall. Just things that say you you may report to us every six months, or you may report to us quarterly. Would it be as necessary to start? That would well, I guess so. Except for I think we, I'd like to see some structure so that we we know that this is getting in place because it is a lot of money and um, and what we also don't want to put too much too much check ins that it's so overburdensome on there that you're spending a whole lot of administrative time. Maybe well, six. Months I think advertising the fund maybe six months might be more appropriate. Yeah. But as far as reporting you guys, maybe that could be a quarterly thing. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have to put that in the legislative document. Um, you said as needed, uh, no later than every six months, right? As needed, no later than every six months. That give you flexibility. And heck, you come in six months, say hi, goodbye. I'm <laughs> not doing anything. Is it, and um, is there? Uh, what about as far as an administrative fee uh, for the local management board? Is that? I, I can't imagine that's not something that should be considered. Does it allow for that? So it's the legislation allows for administrative costs. However, it also can't supplant any, so. I understand, I, I understand 100%. That. That's okay, I, I, I get it. Uh, but if, if this is taking more time for staff, I mean, um, of course it's going to take more time for staff. The question is how much uh, do you need to then? So for example, if they need to hire a brand new person or move somebody from part-time to full-time, that difference could be covered by this money. So um, you're going to have to, though, help us figure out how to separate that out. Well, let's say hypothetically it's 10%. Where does it go within the county? You know, how, how is that going to be separated out, and how is it going to be dispersed? I think to start, they're going to work with current staff. Right. Mm -hmm. And then see where this goes. Additionally, the money right now, I can't project what it will be in the future mm -hmm. because it's dependent upon use. Now it's still novel. We're still receiving money from the payment to convert from medicinal dispensary to uh, adult use cannabis. Mm -hmm. That's a one-time payment and everyone, every entity that was medicinal has already paid that. Mm -hmm. So that's already gonna cut down the amount of revenue. as. Delaware allows for adult use as potentially Virginia allows for de adult use. There's going to be less interstate travel to come to Wicomico County and surrounding counties for this. So the numbers may go down. They may hold the same. It's really a, a hard unknown, but I think the great part about LNB is that they are in a position to advertise, evaluate, and award and make that recommendation to council to finalize the award. 
It's have to go. Does this have to go through the administration, the executive branch, before it goes through the council? <clears throat> it would be beneficial for the executive because, again, working together, everyone has, has said you're going to be aware. This members council are going to be aware of different community initiatives. Mountain County Executive is going to be aware of different community initiatives. So that's where the oversight and LMB's interaction with both sides of the government is beneficial because they're going to be able to target those programs and say, hey, this money's coming up. You should make that application. Okay. So. We, we don't want to suggest that there could be a unilateral um, elimination of a recommended program. We don't want to do that. But we do think it's a, it would be proper to create a courtesy where it flows through the, the um, chain of command. I say chain of command where it flows through the uh, executive and legislative branch, both. But uh, again, it, it can get really sticky, you know. If And I say this would be any executive would say, oh, no, no, I don't really want to, do, to help this group. Right. Then you have an individual who's unilaterally uh, managing this program, and that, that's just something that can't happen. So there could be an opinion, I think, maybe from the executive branch or a recommendation from the executive branch to coincide with uh, Mr. Bosman's presentation to the council. And I just, Did we just make that confusing. No, I, I perfectly got it. I guess the only thing to piggyback on that is when it comes to council and they're saying award fifty thousand dollars to this entity for this program, tinkering with that is really going to take away from LMB's role in the process and saying, we think 45 might be better than, than 50. I understand. I understand. And it's really the, the work that's going to be done, the reviewing of everything is going to be at that LMB level, uh, which is why when it gets before the executive or council to make that final sign off, it should almost be pro forma because they've really done the deep dive on I know. how's I know. it going to be done. I know. So, not too many chiefs. Uh, exactly. And I think council recognizes that. And it's a process. We can start with it, evaluate a year from now, and see where it is. OK. If you feel comfortable, though, now uh, with enough to start? I have enough to put together a draft bit, legislative bill yeah. okay. that could potentially be ready for it's. Do you, would you be ready for first reader at the first meeting in May? Would you want to come back for another work session on that draft bill? <clears throat> I think May would be fine. Yeah. Okay. You First reader. Hmm? <laughs> 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 we got the. Yeah. Uh, anybody have any other questions? No. no? Sounds pretty straightforward. <laughs> Not just, Sounds like a good problem. Yes, Bob. <laughs> um, the uh, state legislation says that this fund is to be used for community based initiatives to benefit low income communities. Funding community based on this that serve dis disproportionately impacted areas. And I think it's in the package that you sent, but it, the disproportionately impacted areas are the 21801 and 21804 zip codes. It's not the entire county. Well, I think that's where Wicom could go purple and Sheriff's Office, Health Department. They're going to have those additional statistics that say, these other zip codes were dramatically impacted by fentanyl and the guidance that we're getting from the state level this is even comar regulations this is just advice from ose i'm just and, i'm just saying i'm confused about it and then there's a list of schools that they put in here which are not all the schools in wakamaco county doesn't include mardella um it doesn't include uh fruitland schools it doesn't include delmar elementary because but it includes basically all the other schools in the county well it's, it's we're not trying to you know you don't, you don't want to dilute it the the areas that were the most impacted obviously. i understand yeah. i'm just confused as to whether yeah. they're saying that those them yeah they, those little that's the the primary focus is, has to be within the 21801 21804 or is that a general guidance? And I don't know the answer to that. Are you know suggesting maybe the Mr. council Bruno. needs to send a letter to say, hey, look, these are your oversights, and we need you to try to correct this again? I think the local management board needs to understand what its guidance is, is my only point, because I it's confusing to me, because if you're in Delmar or you're in Fruitland, 
you're not in the zip code that they're saying is disproportionate. Really good point, Bob. I, mean, I think we should look in, look into it. In Freeland, I, I mean, Pittsville's not in it. Willard's uh, not in it. Part of that's going to deal with the statistics where everyone lives, and if the statistics. substantial concentration is in the city of Salisbury zip codes, that's you're going to have more there than you're going to have out in the rural parts of the county. However, as the advertisement process begins, as we see the various applications and where the applications are coming from, that can be something that LMB can work towards in their award making of the awards. I would agree if there is a $750,000 program for Pittsville, it better be a really good $750,000 <laughs> program for Pittsville because that would account for three quarters when it's not within the disproportionate impact. But we know that substance abuse, substance dependency, and unfortunately drug distribution spans all socioeconomic classes, all parts of the county. So, oh, and that's a good point. But I think I, my only point, maybe if if the the inclination is to use local management board, and it sounds like that's where it's going, maybe he can contact the office of social equity and have discussions so he understands what they're what this means. <laughs> now they I get it. it to be that's, applied. Yeah, I get it. So when he starts out he's <laughs> he's not we're not violating what their standards are. Yeah. I understand yeah. I mean I said this, I understand um, um, years and years ago we had the the Salisbury neighborhood housing mm. and we picked three locations, Camden Avenue, Church Street and the west side of Salisbury because they based it on crime statistics and lack of home ownership. And I think that um, when the local manager board, even the social service department, uh, one of the previous directors had a map and it showed where everything was concentrated at. And most of the areas like Mardello and Fruitland, um, even down the, I said down the road, down, you know, Nanticoke Road, they didn't have the concentration of low-income families or, or that kind of, and that's why they targeted certain areas. And I think some of the money, that's how they targeted money, like local manager board became in existence. They targeted certain areas. I can stand corrected. But uh, they target for it so where the money could be concentrated on, mm -hmm. where was the crime, where is the lack of home ownership, those kind of things, and they found it to be in the particular targeted neighborhoods. I'll leave it with this thought. The other possibility is if the guidance is that it needs to be to disproportionately impact the communities, council could always make the decision based on the additional tax revenue that does not have these requirements from cannabis tied to it to allocate that money to the other zip codes within the county for the similar purpose. So there's, there's going to be other funding that is isn't restricted? Correct. So when we go back to... There's 5% of taxes collected. So of every nine cents on the dollar, this is how it's going to be attributed. And 5% of the taxes collected in each jurisdiction go to that jurisdiction. Now, if you remember back to when I first came here a year ago, it has to be split if it's within a municipality, two and a half percent to the municipality, two and a half percent to the county. Right now, we only have one. It's located within the city. But as the government begins to make the awards for the additional dispensaries, that number could change. So there is going to be money that will be received from cannabis tax revenue that will not be encumbered with restrictions on it. So that's something to consider long term. But I believe we have a great framework to start with for the money that is encumbered. Do you incorporate the unencumbered with the same legislative bill? We don't know how much money that's going to be at this time. It could be okay. de minimis. Because the first thing it's going to do is it's going to fund the cannabis administration because it has to be self-reliant. So I we can work on future right. amendments. That's all great. right. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much, Thank uh, you. Mr. Bowden. Thank you. All right, so I'll have a draft prepared for the first meeting in May. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thanks. Well, next item we have, uh, Mr. Luminati, is the um, ethics laws. Correct, and I'll try to make this one very short. So the state process on that is the State Ethics Commission 
has to approve uh, any code amendments that council makes to the code regard for ethics ordinances. And additionally, uh, biannually, the legislature reviews the ethics code and makes changes based on uh, what has been seen throughout the state. Rather than come to you with a first draft of legislative bill, have you pass it and then send it up to the state for approval, in which case they could potentially veto it, it's easier to come to with what the changes would potentially be to the county code, how they model, how they parrot the model ethics law. And so, for example, we have to add some definitions to the county code to, for home address, uh, what interest is, uh, and it's pretty su sufficient. These changes came about from the Healthy Holly scandal with uh, the mayor of Baltimore. And uh, so these changes are substantially based on that. If it's coming directly from state law, re re realistically, the county doesn't really have a say in it, uh, but the state ethics commission needs to approve because there are there is some tweaking. You'll see it's not verbatim, so that it meets the county's needs, but it's substantially the same. So if there's a consensus to move forward with these ethics changes as required by state law, it will, they'll be sent to the ethics commission at their next meeting. They'll send a letter back saying we approve or disapprove of the proposed amendments. If they approve it, then we'll be before you with a first legislative bill to make the changes. So. Uh, as I said, this is from the model ethics law. You can see at the top, version A, uh, this was all provided in the briefing book in advance for the last two meetings. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But realistically, what I'm saying is like here in 37-11, what's not highlighted is what's in the current county code. Mm -hmm. And they added this B section. So that's being incorporated in the highlighted portion. Uh, so, all right. Any questions or concerns? Yes, Josh. Just one question. The, I know in uh, in previous jobs that I had that I um, I had to register with specific counties as a lobbyist to for that county, and that was multiple counties across the shore. Do we, Wicomico County, by the way, separate? I guess kind of separate from this. I guess do we have our own? Um, process to have a public individual register as a lobbyist for the county so that's really what's getting added at this time you'll see like when i popped it in here this is a former regulated lobbyist so we have some light lobbyist legislation now but it's really this is going to be substantially increased to add these post employment limitations for former public officials uh former elected officials contingent compensation so uh, yeah, we have something the state says it needs to be increased based on some scandals across the bridge, and we're going to address those. Cool. Thank you. Yes. I interpreted this mostly as I think maybe you referenced it, just us looking at what is uh, uh, being recommended by the state, and we're simply accepting that recommendation. Correct. And basically instructing me to forward our proposed recommendations up to the state ethics commission for final approval then we would go through the normal legislative bill process to amend the code so it would be first reader public hearing advertisement second reader so we're, we're not completely going around but it's sort of an analogy would be like the planning commission text amendment goes to the planning commission it works its way up to council at the end of the day yeah. but here we're just saying to a state ethics commission to say these are our proposed changes get the letter blessing them and then move forward are you okay with this as, right. it's, as it's written all right all right thank you very much i know that's thank tedious and thank you for your work tonight i know it's a long night mm -hmm. you, you have finish. much to do finish. appreciate it all right thank, thank you thank you very much Mr. Padgham. Andrew. Yes. If you want to stay and hang out, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Next item on the agenda is the overview of the Tri-County Council for the Lower Eastern Shore. We have with us uh, Mr. Greg Padgham, Executive Director, Mr. Andrew, is it Weil? Weil. Yes, Weil, 
Transit Director and Ms. Monique uh, Snyder, Regional Communications Developer. Uh, for the public, just let every let the public know who is whom, who is who, whichever. Thank you very much, uh, Council. You have a lot of work to do. It's late at night, and we appreciate <laughs> the ability to come before you. Thank you also to the administration for allowing us uh, to come before you. Uh, as you know, every year we make a fiscal uh, year request for local match funding for transit. But before we went into that, I, I know that you've already seen the letter that we've given to the executive. I wanted to give you a brief overview of what the council is and what you get for your money over and above just transit, public transit. First of all, we're an independent state agency and uh, under our enabling legislation, the local governing bodies of Somerset, Wacomico, and Worcester counties, the legislation says that they shall appropriate a minimal uh, annual amount of $10,000 each. We use that for operating expenses and some of the uh, branding and marketing uh, projects that uh, we're engaged in. Everything else comes from the state or the feds, and uh, there's no cost to the county. <clears throat> I would say one thing about the, uh, the Tri-County Council. From its very inception, it was all about broadband development. Um, the Tri-County Council and, Mid and the Midshore Regional Council, which is Dorchester, Caroline, and Talbot counties, they were intrinsically involved in the expansion and the further development of broadband service to the Eastern Shore. What there was was a Governor's Eastern Shore Economic Development Task Force from 2000 under Governor Glenn Denning. There were two rec uh, of the recommendations that came out of there. Two of them were the following. One, create a permanent regional planning organization, including the timely implementation of the recommendations of this task force. Recommendation four was implement a high-speed fiber optic network on the eastern shore of uh, Maryland to meet current and future needs. In 2002-2003, uh, a request for proposals for studies were submitted by the Tri-County Council, and it resulted in the Maryland Eastern Shore Broadband Network Strategic, Pl uh, Strategic Plan Final Report. In 2003, the Tri-County Council followed the, the Midshore Regional Council in submitting the first Regional Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy Report. Uh, report. In 2004, uh, the uh, uh, Yankee Group Research Municipal Broadband Assessment was a a completed. It was financially supported by, among others, the Tri-County Council for the Lower Eastern Shore of Maryland. In 2006, during a legislative session, Senate Bill 753, Rural Broadband Communication Services was established for the purposes of creating the, Ru the Maryland Rural Broadband Coordination Board. The Tri-County Council was on that board. <clears throat> The legislation enabled the Maryland Broadband Co-op to be formed and receive initial, and receive initial funding of $8 million. In 2006, with considerable input from the Tri-County Council, the Articles of Incorporation were drafted for the Maryland Broadband Cooperative and accepted by the Maryland Department of Assessments and Taxation. At that point, the Executive Director of the Tri-County Council for Low Eastern Shore of Maryland was put on the Board of Directors of Maryland Broadband as one of only five Class A members. So you, the Tri-County Council, you're one of only five Class A members in this statewide organization. <clears throat> in 2007, Maryland Broadband Cooperative, uh, Cooperative partnered with the Tri-County Council to receive $3.2 million in EDA grant to build out Eastern Shore fi an Eastern Shore Fiber Network. More than half of this amount went to redundancy around Salisbury. Uh, in 2007, Maryland Broadband created a direct fiber link between Fa uh, Pax River and Wallops and on to Bol uh, Baltimore and the Coordination Board, was uh, which was composed of the Rural Maryland Council Chairman and the five Maryland State Secretaries and your Regional Council, the Tri-County Council. We directed funds in tranches to Maryland Broadband to have that build out done for Pax River. In 2008, Maryland Broadband entered into a, 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 a uh, Maryland Broadband Cooperative entered into an agreement with the U.S. Navy to run six miles of fiber optic cable under the Chesapeake Bay from Cove Point in Calvert County to Taylor's Island, Dorchester County, to create redundant link between Pax, Pax River and Wallops. Total investment was $24 million from DOD. Your Tri-County Council sat on the board of directors that made the decisions 
for that money and signing that contract. In 2009, the Tri-County Council uh, submitted request and documentation to EDA to become a permanent <coughs> EDA Economic Development District. So you are now in a permanent Economic Development District EDA, under EDA. In 2009 to 2014, during that series of years, uh, the, uh, there was a broadband mapping and planning grant for $6 million from uh, National uh, Transportation, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, from NTIA. Uh, a partnership between Maryland Broadband Cooperative and Salisbury University created uh, uh, ESRGC or Eastern Shore Regional GIS Cooperative. The Tri-County Council was a founding member of that and still funds it. This is just broadband. As you can see, there are a lot of other things up here too. The total investment is almost $200 million since about 2002. And the Tri-County Council has been right smack dab in the middle of it. The Tri-County Council also sits on the Board of Directors of the Rural Maryland Council. Uh, it also sits on the MPO. Our relationship with the Rural Maryland Council is essentially a founding member. It is a semi-independent government agency under the Maryland Department of Agriculture. It was dead in the water. There was no funding. Nothing was happening. The Tri-County Council for the Lower Eastern Shore of Maryland and the Metro Regional Council got that funding went up to Annapolis, spent a lot of time, spent a lot of money, bought nice ties, sat in front of people, and made sure it got funded. Uh, this happened under my predecessor's tenure. Uh, currently, it is fully funded. Its funding last year and this year was more than $9 million. If you look up here, the money that has gone to the lower shore just in, let's see, where is it? This might be there it is, RIMPIF in the bottom. From fiscal year 19 through fiscal year 24, the RIMPIF funding to the tri count or to the uh, to the lower shore has been 9.37 million dollars. That's all state money, and the match is usually in kind from an organization, or a city, or a county. Um, our relationship with EDA. If you look at the funds up here. In EDA, the total funding, this is at the bottom, EDA funding FY02 to FY24, approximately $12.6 million has come to this area through EDA. And that is primarily because you are an EDA economic development district. That includes the $5.52 million upgrade uh, EDA investment for the uh, Civic Center. The Workforce Development Board, in 2003, the counties made the decision to leverage the efficiencies of the Tri-County Council as the Regional Economic Development Planning Agency by delegating the authority to administer the Workforce Investment Board and the state and federal funds associated with SAME. From fiscal year 19 to Q3 of FY24, state and federal funds brought to the lower shore through the, the uh, Workforce Development Board are approximate, approximately $16.435 million. Uh, Administrative Services Division of the Tri-County Council. It does two things besides keeping that nice office complex there for people like the uh, Maryland Department of Labor and others to sit in. It also has, it uh, get, uh, collects rent from its tenants. It also provides payroll and other, other services to 11 counties around the state of Maryland. That money is, to, to a large extent, re, uh, unrestricted. We are able to use that money as kind of a bridge loan to keep some of these programs going until the Comptroller of Maryland pays us state and federal monies. They're federal monies that are administered through the state. So we're using that business model there to help us keep these other programs going that are funded by the state and the feds. Shore Transit, if you look at Shore Transit, this is the money that's come from the state and the feds just from fiscal year 19 through Q3 fiscal year 24. And that right there, that to totals almost $36 million. This is not money that you did, this is money that we got because you provided the local match that is required by the state and the feds to get that federal money and that state money. Um, and then I'm going to, before I turn it over to, to Andy, I, I wanted to, uh, Monique to give you just a little bit of an idea of what we do with regard to branding and marketing for the region and getting people to know 
who we are, what we do, not the Tri-County Council, but the region itself. Monique. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present before you. My name is Monique Snyder. I am the Regional Communications Developer for the Tri-County Council, and I'll just share a few of our regional marketing efforts this evening. So the Tri-County Council provides the following services to increase visibility of the businesses and industries of Wicomico County and in the region. Those industries range from agriculture to manufacturing and tourism. The Regional Economic Development website, lesmd.net, designed and maintained in-house by the Tri-County Council. For example, just recently the search term Eastern Shore Agriculture Crops recently delivered a Google Analytics driven result from the, this website at the top of the page. So we were on the first page of Google. In-house designed regional billboards, branded merchandise, other printed materials such as the Lower Shore Regional Economic Development Guide, exhibitor at the Ocean City Trade Show, Maryland Association of County Summer Conference, and the Rural Maryland Conference where the Tri-County Council acts as a back office and promoter of the Lower Shore County Economic Development and Tourism Offices. Sponsorship of the Lower Shore General Assembly Wrap-Up and Luncheon, JA Inspire, the Eastern Shore Luncheon at the Winter Mako Conference, Rural Maryland Day in Annapolis and others. Plan and execute the annual Taste of the Eastern Shore Legislative Reception in Annapolis, which includes a personal visit by the Tri-County Council staff to every single office of the House of Delegates and the Senate prior to the event of 400 people itself. And represent the region to business persons and officials around the state, including the secretary level and office of the governor. I don't think that can be overlooked. I mean, that's 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 a uh, discreet lobbying that you can't you can't you, you can't judge the value of how great that is to meet with them individually and independently. So, so that's what we wanted to do because we do come before you each year. Uh, and, and we ask uh, in our fiscal or new fiscal year budget, local match funding for uh, regional transit. Uh, we wanted to, to let you know some of the other things that we do and have done for more than 20 years. And with that, I'd like to uh, turn it I, over did to Did I interrupt you, Monique? Nope, that was the end. That's the end, okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. She and I staged this beforehand, so we, I knew, I knew where to start. <laughs> I know better than to cut her off. <laughs> it was planned. I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Andy uh, if you have any specific questions regarding our FY25 uh, request for, for, for funding for transit. Uh, but before uh, we did that, I would uh, wish you would allow Andy to give you a little bit of an idea of some of the efficiencies we are building into the system. Sure. So that the transit system itself is more efficient, it's not just burning up tires and gasoline. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Propane. <laughs> I'm your transit director, Andy Weil came to you last year with uh, a lot of problems and a lot of issues. And I wanted to thank you for fully funding our request for operational local match, which is federally mandated for all of our programs. So one question that was asked to me that I really was sort of caught off guard with was what do we get for the money? So I'm going to give you that bit of information. We came to you with a three-year plan. We were anticipated to be $1.3 million over budget this year, and we were $800 million over budget at the time we spoke last. <clears throat> we had a three-year plan that would bring us to a balanced budget. We made some efficiencies. We made some changes, some service cuts that we felt were minimal <clears throat> as much. I don't mean to minimize them, but they were a small amount of the total. We did a lot of internal work, and surprisingly enough, we would be able to balance the budget this year completely. Okay. That's good. It, it is, and it is, it is because of the people that work there that committed to making the change that they hated because they believed in it. We also were told that we were going to be receiving a great deal more funding. MTA has said all along they don't actually know why we get what we get other than we always got what we got. And we were flat funded since 2008 and there's no more money in the bucket. <clears throat> they have committed to the funding formula change this year, which is based on 10% of it's based on population and the other 90% is based equally on 
hours driven, miles driven, and trips. What that does for shore transit is enable us to accept $1.8 million of federal and state funding Additional. as well. Additionally, on top of what we had always gotten. It's a 77% increase as long as we have the local match. What we have, and that came in the crux of receiving two different letters, so we had to make an amendment. What we came to the conclusion is, is that it would be irresponsible to accept the, to request money for the entire amount because we can't responsibly use it. We're not prepared to do 77% more work in an efficient and effective manner. We've been preparing. We are recruiting, we are training our own people, and it is working, but we're not ready. What we're asking for is, with the local match and the state and federal, a total of an additional $1 million, and that represents about 10,000 hours of service. What that means for Wicomico County is an additional $175,913. Uh, <laughs> Of local match, local operating match, mm -hmm. plus there is a very small amount in STAP, which is Statewide Specialized Transportation Assistance Program from the state. That's what does the elderly and the disabled transportation in Wicomico County. Uh, the other two counties do their own. They have now, uh, it's now in regulation that they attach uh, cost of living. That's the wrong term but it's 3%, it's actually pi, 3.14% increase this year. Um, and it will continue to be tied to that. So it's a small amount of money. I believe it's $1,500 of additional match from Wicomico County to leverage about $6,000 worth of additional. So the, the difference we are requesting, Tri-County Council's $951,499. What we're going to do with that, we're already because we committed to turning on the, the services that we suspended, we are doing that as we speak. As a matter of fact, we're listening to uh, Councilman Wynn help me uh, connect the dots with uh, a need, and we're, we're adding a stop. We're working with Salisbury University for, and the city of Salisbury with some guidance within Salisbury. We are turning on some regional service that we had turned off. We are going to talk with MTA tomorrow about figuring out how to get dialysis transportation back where it belongs in a way, in a way that doesn't break the budget. We did that with SDAP before. We, we took a $180,000 program and used 400 and some odd thousand dollars worth of service. That was part of the, so now we're committed to fixing it. We also are on the, on the verge within the next two weeks, we should be able to see vendor proposals. We've received a, stu a grant, $360,000 grant for areas of persistent poverty. So Salisbury is great. They, they, people need to come to Salisbury. People need to come to Fruitland and up and down this corridor. It's important. It's a, it's a major hub. But there's a lot of people who live in places like down Nanticoke Road and, and Willards and and places in the center of the county that don't even show up on Google Maps, but people live there, real people live there, and this study is designed and focused on them, and we're getting, it's $360,000 to do a complete redesign. So we're cautiously turning on service that we, we know that there's a need and it won't, it won't hurt anything that we do it, but in six months, I anticipate that we will have expert guidance on how to redesign this study and how to do it better and that includes what vehicles we use we don't need large vehicles that can't get into rural areas they they landlock us so we've already committed some funds i'm asking you please to consider doing what you had done last year which is providing us the fully requested operational all the local match that that we need and we will continue to do more with your money than we've done before. And we will continue to have an open ear at your request. I will, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I was just thinking the cannabis was just here and we're talking about the LNB <coughs> money. Is that something that Tri-County Council can apply for? That, that money from uh, the cannabis? Because we got a million dollars from uh, from the from the state from the you know from receiving money from the cannabis I didn't know 
I'm just thinking outside the box. I mean, you're, you're saying Salisbury and Fruitland and lower income housing, and that seems to me like that fits in that, it might fit in that parameter to where you can apply. I'm not saying that we're not gonna give you the money. I'm just saying like that's another avenue as well. It can't well. supplement it anyway. Huh? It can't, the, the, the cannabis yeah. funds can't supplement whatever we may have. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it won't supplement it. No, no, but I was just thinking that that might be another Not avenue to get money. Um, Most important, I think it's another avenue to make sure that we're seeing these people that we haven't been able to see before. So if, if there is no more money to be had, there is local knowledge about the populations that yeah. I don't see. I don't realize they're there, and, and that is... That's a great avenue. I'm, we're really limited on the way that we can use money and we can accept money, and we have to be very, very careful. We can't compete with local business, and we can't compete, and we have to be cautious about how, which funding sources, where the money comes from, so that we are not double dipping. Right. Well, it's, it's something we could look into. We could, but we could see how it might fit in the, sure. in the overall project. Right. But. Um, now, we appreciate the, the presentation. Yeah. We really do. Um, I, I think it's important for everyone to recognize just how much the state does rely on Tri-County Council when they're determining how they're going to distribute the funds or the grants that they might have to the local level. They certainly do depend on Tri-County Council. We saw that with Hogan when he came down here with $10 million. Where did it go? It went to the Tri-County Council. And I think he did a great job of dispersing it locally. Yeah, if, I'm, if I may say, this is uh, Greg Padram again, Executive Director. The reason the 10 million was put through the five regional councils of which we are one is because of the template that had been created with RIMPIF funds through Rural Maryland Council. Mm -hmm. Because of the grant and subgrant uh, aspect of that, the reporting, the reliability of it. And so when they were looking around for a way to put this $50 million out there, someone up at the state, I won't say who, said, the regional councils. Mm -hmm. The regional councils and RIMPIF is a good model. Uh, that's the way that they've been doing it, and let's let's do that. And we trust the regional councils to, and I'm not the regional council, you're the regional councils. You're one third of the regional councils. We trust them uh, to, as boots on the ground, to decide how to distribute it. Right, but you know, don't take away from yourself either. I mean, you you have this, the Tri-County Council that we have now is a, is on, is the Tri-County Council on steroids from what all of you are operating, because we sit in the meetings on a regular basis, and I can see the difference in just you know so many years ago, and you surround yourself as you have here, you surround yourself with stellar talent. I've seen, I've seen Monique's work personally, and it's absolutely amazing what you do, and the that's comment about first on the Google list, that's not easy to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And Andy, I've, I've witnessed your presentations as well, 10, 20 fold as far as what you're doing in providing more services, and I mean cutting down to a fine science. So I really do appreciate what you've done with that as well. So He's a, he's a quick thinker and a quick study. If he says he's going to do it, he does it. Yeah. Yeah, imagine that. Yeah, right. He, yeah. Got some luck going on there, yeah. too. Uh, <laughs> I would, mm. right. uh, any questions from anybody? Yeah. Appreciate your good work. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate yeah. the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry to hold you up so late. Oh, no problem. We're just happy to be here. Definitely worth it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you. All right. Are we uh Ten a motion to adjourn to go to closed session? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.